Um, this is a three day um, session. And so um, please feel free to, um, if you can, and if you're able to, please turn your cameras on. I'm, I believe this is gonna be a very interactive session. If you can, please turn it on. Um, and if you need to step away, take a breather, go get some coffee or stretch, please feel free to turn it off and do what you need. Um, but we would love to see your faces this morning as we participate and we're gonna be together for three days from eight to 4 p.m. Uh, we will have our lunches. Um, so you can take a break with that and hopefully step away from your computer. Um, this session is also going to be recorded. And once you complete all three days, we will be issuing you your certificates of participation and being here with us today. If you have any questions and or co um, concerns, please shoot me a text, a message here on the chat. Um, and I will support you in the background. Uh, we will also be having breakout rooms. And again, if you can please turn your cameras on um, while you're in those breakout rooms, that would be great as well. Um, other than that, I hope you all enjoy your training this um, today and tomorrow and um, Thursday. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to David Garvin uh, who created this training for you all with um, Scott Miller. So we're really excited to have you all here. And again, welcome. Thank you, Terry. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for giving this amount of time. It is just, it's a lot to ask, but I know that Scott has got a lot to give. Um, and if you don't know Scott already, you will certainly know him after today and for sure after the next three days. Um, but we are going to um, to the uh, the source really of understanding the coordinated community response. And I'm confident that this is going to make a difference in all of our communities around New Mexico. Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. We're all looking forward to this. And a special thank you all to all of you who have your, your cameras on. Um, that's, there's two reasons for that. One is, um, as a trainer, it makes a huge difference to be able to see the faces and the people of who you're talking to um, I've been in Scott's shoes and know just, it's just kind of odd to, uh, to, to talk to a bunch of blank squares. So thank you. It's a lot to ask, um, to have your camera on for the next three days, but it's going to make a big difference for all of us. It's also going to be a very interactive training. This isn't just a matter of Scott talking for the next three days, although I know he could do it. Um, this is a, a matter of engagement and talking and, and um, sharing about what we need to do in New Mexico to make the difference that we want to see in uh, changing how uh, we are working to promote survivor safety and offender accountability. And with that, Scott, thank you so much. Uh, I'm turning it over to you. Well, thanks, David. And you're very generous. I appreciate it. Um, all right, so uh, as David said, uh, 41 years ago, um, Ellen Pence and uh, two other women started a organization in the kitchen of a, of a free clinic here in Duluth. And they had this idea that um, after working with women in shelters that they kept asking different entities in the community for help when they weren't getting it. Um, and so they had this idea that maybe we should try to find a city that was open to this idea of coordinating all these different agencies work together um, so that when a woman called for help, um, she actually got it. And, uh, and so that, that method that she ended up developing, uh, Ellen Pence, uh, became known as the Duluth model um, method of organizing. And, um, and so we're gonna, learn, we're gonna learn about that today. We're gonna learn about a lot of components of this. This is what I do. Um, I'm not retired. Um, I'm not talking about stuff I used to do. I'm talking about stuff I did last week um, because this is most of what I've done over the last 21 years uh, working for this agency, uh, mentored by Ellen um, uh, who started it. So, uh, and again, just to reiterate what David said, uh, it is so much more interesting to see all your wonderful faces um, as a trainer than to look at mine. Um, and when you ask questions, it's good to be able to make eye contact because I can see all of you uh, with your cameras on and a big screen. So uh, we try to replicate an in-person as much as we can. Um, 
All right. So what the first thing we're going to do is, is get some practice into small groups. And so uh, Jeff is going to, who's working with me today off camera, is going to be uh, uh, setting those up. And if you could, uh, uh, 10. Um, and then if, if uh, uh, Jeff, could you pull up the first slide for me or the second slide? Thank you. All right. So what we want you to do in your small group just to get used to being in that space if you haven't done it, um, is you'll get an invitation that comes across your screen. Um, if you accept it, um, then it'll put you in the small group. On that will be a one, two, three, four. Uh, that'll, be the, your, that'll be your small group. And in your small group, if you would share with your team um, the name, location, your agency position, kind of a brief intro introduction of who you are, um, what does your role or position, what role does your position play in a coordinated response, right? As you imagine it, and maybe you don't know, right? Uh, maybe you don't know how, what role that would that piece would play in a larger response, but that's part of the conversation. And then what do you hope to get from the training? And then if you would just switch around um, as you get into these small groups as to who will kind of take notes. So what I like to do is, is when we come back, I'll ask those note takers to kind of kick off your team's conversation. Anybody can join but it just helps kind of keep things going if somebody's been assigned to be the person to kind of uh, kick off whatever conversation you ended up having in your small group. Okay, so Scott, that'll be the opening. Scott, before we uh, 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 transport people magically into the private rooms, can you just give folks an outline of today's agenda so they'll be able to plan for breaks and lunch and things like that? Sure, okay, so, um, yeah, so I, I know that Teresa said it's a, it's a gloomy day there in, in New Mexico. I woke up to 13 below wind chills up here. So things, are, things, things aren't gloomy, they're frozen. Um, but uh, uh, today what we're going to do is, um, uh, well, there'll be a break at, at, at 1030 your time, and then, um, which is an, an hour and a half, and then... Um, uh, 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 at noon, we'll break for lunch for an hour, and then we'll have an afternoon break uh, at 2.30, and then we'll end at 4.30, I believe, um, is the time. So your time. So uh, that'll be how the, the time lays out. And then we'll all get into the content um, as we, as we, after we come back from uh, a small group into, into the next slide. All right, does that help, David? Great, all right. All right, anybody have any questions what you're gonna do in your small groups? All right, you should be getting an invitation from Jeff and we will see you uh, in about 10 minutes. If you haven't, if you've been on Zoom, which I'm guessing you have, you realize that when you're having a conversation in small group, Zoom decides when you're done. <laughs> Just pulls you out of the room. All right. Scott, I, there's one thing I wanted to say. I, I thought about, um, I, and I said it to my breakout group, but I wanted to, I'm sure you're going to say it a couple of times, but I want to make sure it gets under underscored as well. And that is so many people around the world know about the Duluth model. Um, but what they know about it really isn't what the Duluth model is. And, and so I'm so excited. The, uh, the Duluth model, folks, is not the power and control wheel. That's a tool that came out of Duluth. The Duluth model is not the DAIP curriculum. That is kind of an adjunct, if you will, to uh, what Scott's going to be talking about. The Duluth model is how do we work together in communities? And that's really... That's the, the, um, the power and the joy of what we're gonna be going through for the next three days. It's, it's way beyond those two things that have come to symbolize um, the Duluth model behind Scott, um, but that's just not even the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, thank you, David. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the method of organizing that we're gonna talk about is typically used um, to organize government systems but they can be, but if it can be used to organize um, uh, within a medical system, it could be organized in a, in a faith-based community. Um, all the same kinds of things that we have to organize for within, the, within government systems also apply 
to all these different communities. So um, it's really a way, a, a method of organizing. It's a way to filter or a lens to look through when we're trying to find a way to make something work um, that increases safety, um, has a way of holding offenders accountable, um, and actually in this context makes the, um, the work of the practitioner um, improved. Um, and if you can do all three of those things, you can probably come up with a sustainable response. So um, yeah, well, thank you, David. And, and it has been used all over the world. That's the nice thing. We've got projects going in Canada. Uh, we just finished one in Australia that we'll talk about uh, t today a little bit. Um, and a project, a really exciting project with indigenous folks in Hawaii. Um, and so there's just a lot of different ways in which this work gets applied to different communities um, around the globe. And we uh, have, the, have the honor to be able to be part of that uh, work with them. So yeah, great. All right, so um, those of you who were assigned, um, kind of the kick off the conversations, uh, who wants to jump in first about just the, the nature of your um, conversation in your small group? I can go. So um, great, thanks, break out. I think we're a breakout uh, group number two. So we had a variety of um, individuals coming from the courts, probation officers, victim advocates, uh, ranging from you know victim advocates and supervisors and managers. We had um, individuals from Wisconsin and New York as well joining in. So that's that's great to have that. So that we can get outside perspectives from New Mexico and our local communities. Um, Everyone is excited to be here to learn, to network, to um, get new information, but also the practical information as well to see uh, or to know how this, you know, this information is actually going to be applied in the field. What was, uh, what was, was there a theme about what people were hoping to get um, from the training? I think it really just knowledge, overall knowledge of, you know, there wasn't anything really specific, but just to really gauge how it's going to be used you know, in, Great. in the community setting. So I think that would probably be the-, the All the, right. I, all right, appreciate it, Aaron. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, who's next? I'll go next. We, all right, uh, Amber. So our group um, was actually really from all over New Mexico. Um, I'm from <clears throat> the courthouse. I'm a probation officer lead work in the behavioral health unit. We had a legal advocate, um, domestic violence specialist for CYFD and BHD, um, the executive director of the Torrance County Domestic Violence Program, <clears throat> a shelter case manager for family crisis in Farmington, um, and Sandoval County Prevention and Intervention Program, um, as well as um, our Director of Battering Intervention Services and Systems Response for New Mexico Coalition Against Domestic Violence. All of us really just wanted to learn um, more about assisting the individuals that we work with, as well as making some of the more community ties as we're all here kind of working towards the same goal. Great. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, thank you, Amber. Anybody else would like to jump in for their team? And what, what did, you know, basically the question is, what did you, uh, what did you hope to get from the training? I just saw a hand go up, but then it disappeared. That was me. I didn't know if you could oh. see that. So I decided I would just speak uh, and take well, it, 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 it. It can be slow. I can be slow to come to it. So uh, uh, don't ever take your hand down, Angela. I'll eventually see it. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so my name's Angela Parent and we were, I think we were group four. Um, there were, um, we were all mostly from New Mexico. We had one person there from Arizona. Um, we had uh, batter intervention programs, uh, attorney, uh, advocates, program managers, DV coordinators, um, kind of a little bit of everybody. Um, we have one gentleman here who's from the Nambe Pueblo. So um, those services are a little bit different. He was talking about um, they're not under CYFD and they, um, their law enforcement is, you know, the BIA. So some things that may be a little bit different um, from what the rest of us were, were used to dealing with. Um, 
we kind of uh, didn't really get around to a lot of people's kind of expectations or what they were hoping to get out of this. But the one person that did speak to that, um, I feel like we probably, a lot of us would agree with that, um, just kind of how to get us organized um, as a response team to be able to get us moving in the right direction. Um, I don't know about the other programs, but I know for myself, we don't have a solid um, team as far as um, get it, just like getting it established. We tried two or three times and we get rolling and then something happens. And so um, I know that, that that's what they spoke to, kind of getting organized and how to move forward. And I know that's what I would be, I would be looking forward to as well. So Angela, can I ask you this? Um, when those teams got going and then they kind of fizzled out, what do you think the reason that they fizzled for those previous times? Okay, well, um, so the, the years that I've been involved, I've been kind of trying to, to lead that up, right? Um, and when we've gotten started, it becomes um, only the same one or two people, two or three people um, show up, and I'm the only one ever, like, speaking and giving input and providing training information, and, like, it's just a, a time for me to talk. Like, you know what I mean? Nobody mm -hmm. else really participates or, or takes charge on things. And so this last time we fizzled out was when we were working from home and, uh, you know, uh, Zoom meetings are not quite the same and people are, are a little more likely to dismiss um, interactions or, or participation. And I just got frustrated and I said, I'll start again at the first of the year. So maybe this is good timing for this training. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. So what you just described is a really common struggle with teams around the country um, is that they have a hard time holding retention. So one of the lenses that we need to look at that, that if you're going to have a big meeting like that, um, it has to be meaningful to everybody you invite. And then how do you, how do you do that? How do you make it meaningful for everybody in that room? Because if it isn't meaningful, if my, if I spend an hour at a meeting and I walk away and my job is no different than the, when, when I walked in, then what's the, what's my, what's the point of coming back? Right. And spending that time. So, um, so yeah, we have to, we, we can't just invite people to a meeting and hope that that's going to be the thing that pulls us together. It isn't. Um, it's going to be the work. And so, um, so we're going to talk about different ways of, of organizing uh, as we go forward that, that hopefully can address some of what Angela was talking about. Uh, Michaela, is that, did I get that right? Yeah, it's a hard one. Um, it's Michaela. Um, most people Michaela. call Michaela or Q. You can, anybody can just call me Q. That's what most of my students call me. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, our group was also a mix of um, individuals and in different disciplines and, and different efforts. Also, we didn't just have people from New Mexico, we had people from um, across the country. And I'm just gonna read off some of the common themes of what people were looking to get out of this. Um, how to better assist coworkers, motivating information for a CCRT, um, how to increase knowledge and communication, understanding a more upstream, upstream approach, um, how to work with um, young men um, in, creating programs or something around that so that we can address these issues early on, um, how to be a better advocate and um, what makes these programs successful and how to increase engagement. Okay, all right. Yeah, and, and so those are, those are interesting to me. It'll be interesting to after the, after the third day to go back to, to that list queue and see how that shifted um, as far as what I think is important um, to, uh, uh, to um, prioritize, right? Um, relationships are crucial. Trust is crucial um, in this work. However, the reason we do it is to make it safer for people in our community that are experiencing violence, right? And so how do we link all of what Q just talked about? I feel like I'm in Star Trek and I'm saying Q. Um, <laughs> uh, how do we link what Q is just talking about um, to the lives of those folks that are depending upon somebody responding in a way that's going to make it safer for them, right? Yeah, good. Okay. So, Jeff, do you want to pull up the next slide? All right. Um, this is, these are some of the foundations when we're talking about uh, organizing, uh, and that's really the word you're going to hear a lot of. It's not about a meeting. It's about organizing. 
Um, the meeting can be a, a piece of the organizing, but the organizing is really is what, what, what drives this work. Um, a shared understanding of the problem. Number one reason I have found why teams don't get anything done. I, 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 five years ago, I brought, brought into a team that had been meeting for 24 years. They said, we've been meeting for 24 years and we've done nothing except argue about what everybody else does not do. <laughs> we are really good at that, but we're not good at moving things forward. And so um, when I started talking to individual practitioners outside of that meeting, what I realized is that everybody had a different lens for looking at the problem. The lens that you look at the problem will dictate what you think the solution is. So when you get 15 people in a room who have 15 different ways of thinking about the solution, it's going to be tough to pull that together into a cohesive vision. <clears throat> so what we did is we spent the first two months doing part of the meeting um, talking about the problem that we're intervening in and trying to come to a to an understanding. Today is going to be a lot of that. I'm going to be linking what we understand about domestic violence and why it happens to how you apply that to a CCR, right? And, and, and making a bridge between those two things. A method of sharing information. Again, it's crucial. If, if, if everybody holds on to what they know and doesn't share it with anybody else, there, there's nothing really to coordinate, right? Because information is, it, the, the more you know, the better your decisions will be, flat out. The less you know, the more challenging your decisions are gonna be to the rest of the team. So where do I hear this the most? Judges. They get, I'm sitting in a room full of people who know way more about this case than I do, but I'm the one who's positioned to decide. And then when I make a decision, they all want to criticize me because I made the wrong one because of what they know. But they didn't get me what they know. Get what they know in front of me, respect due process, right? And then I'll make better decisions. It took us two years to figure out how to collect, analyze, and distribute risk information in a way that the judge had challenged us to do. And now today, this morning, there is a judge in arraignment court in Duluth who has the same risk information as the pretrial release agent, who has the same information as the defense attorney and the prosecutor. Everybody knows the same thing about this individual, right? Um, produced starting at 6.30 a.m. this morning by a staff member of ours at the police department. If we didn't have that partnership, if we didn't have access to that information, we'd be back in a fragmented system the way we were before um, before this started, right? Um, so information sharing is crucial. Um, centering survivors within systemic change initiatives. What institutions have a tendency to do is move in a direction that when things change, it changes for the benefit of what they're trying to accomplish. And then the people we serve have to find their way into that system. What we want to do with the Duluth model is go to the people that we serve, find out what their struggle is with the system, and that becomes the agenda for change, right? So we're trying to align the system to the needs of the people we serve, rather than try to get the people we serve to align with the needs of the system that is, you know, has whatever they, they, they might need um, in that moment, right? So we're, we're, it's, it's right turning that around. Um, Discovering the source of systemic problems. <laughs> Another big issue. Uh, people, th people see a problem happen in court. They'll see a problematic police report. They'll see child protection um, take kids from a woman who's being battered. And they think they know what the problem is. And typically they're criticizing an individual. They're, 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 they're pointing a finger at somebody. What they're not seeing is the system that individual is working in. That's what needs to change, right? So if you've got a probation agent standing in front of a judge telling a story about an offender and you're wondering why are they telling that story? Why don't they care about what he, did, uh, what he or she did to, uh, to the victim? 
right? And then you find out that the, what they're standing up there, they're reading off of a form. And you say, well, why are you telling them that? Well, because this is what's on my form. Oh, so if I want you to say something different, I got to change the form, right? Because <laughs> that's what you're held accountable to, right? We get so stuck on criticizing individual behavior rather than looking at the system that operates behind that. That's really what the Duluth model um, is organized to do, is, is, is name what that system is um, that's behind individual actions uh, uh, that, that, that you're frustrated. Here's a quick example. I go down to our domestic violence response team and the domestic violence investigators for the police department are just furious. They said, sit down, we gotta talk to you about the city attorney's office. They don't give a damn about domestic assault cases. Okay, well, I know that's not the truth because I work with them, right? But they are, this is, so tell me what your frustration is. We asked for a warrant request. We got guys that we can go pick up, but we need those things signed. And they're not processing. It takes sometimes a whole month before we get one of those things back. So they don't care. That's, they, that's what they think the source of the problem is. They don't care right? So as the person who coordinates that work, I can't take that on, right? Because I don't know. I really don't know what the, what, the, what the struggle is. So I go up to the city attorney's office. Carrie uh, Schmies was the uh, city attorney at the time who was, who was there. I said, hey, Carrie, do you have a, I've never asked you how you process warrant requests. Um, could you walk me through that process? I don't tell them anything about what just happened, right? Because I don't want to, I, I want to make things work. I want people to work together, right? So he says, sure, come on in. So we go in, he gets a clipboard off of the wall and on one side of it is uh, in, the other side is out. And when I go down the list, the most that a warrant request sat in the office was three days. Well, okay, so how is it that they think it's a month and this is, right? So follow the paperwork, right? So I said, Carrie, when you get done as a prosecutor signing off on a warrant request, where does it go? He said, well, we bring it out to admin out front. I said, could you walk me out and introduce me? Sure, walk out, introduce me to this uh, person sitting at the desk. And, and, uh, and I said, so you get the warrant requests when, when the prosecutors get done with them? Yep. I said, so what do you do with them when you uh, get them? Well, she said, I put them in a, um, a, a little box here and once a month, I bring them down to the police department. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right, right. It's not about nobody caring. It's not about, you know, insensitivity. It's about the fact that nobody communicated to this new administrative staff person that when you get these on a daily basis, they have to go down to the investigators, right? So that's a really simple one. But every time I get involved in one of these things and somebody points a finger, it is never what they think it is. It's always something behind that, that's, that's really, that we're blinded to, that it takes work to figure out. Um, yeah, so partnering on institutional changes which involve creating policy, protocols, and structural shifts across the coordinated response. If you actually want to be coordinated, and we're gonna talk about kind of what that means in a minute, but if you actually wanna be coordinated, you have to take, Okay, so let's take, a, let's take a hypothetical. You've got eight agencies involved and each agency is 100 people and you get a call for help on domestic assault. How do you get 100 people in an agency to respond in a similar way to a similar set of circumstances, right? How do you have a predictable response, one that you can count on? It isn't going to be through training. I can guarantee you, you cannot train a hundred people into compliance. It doesn't work. What does, what do they comply with? They comply with policy. They comply with pro, because that's what they're held accountable to. If you do not change the policy, you don't change the behavior, right? So the policy at 911, when a domestic call comes in to the, to the call taker, has to, has to guide the call taker and the dispatcher to make sure that they're operating in a way that positions the next person who's gonna respond, which is the law enforcement officer, right? And if the law enforcement officer's policy is positioned in, a, in, a, in, in, a, in the right way, it's gonna position the prosecutor to be able to do the job that they're designed to do. For example, if you're a police officer 
and you're investigating crime to the to the burden of probable cause and the prosecutor has to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt which is the highest burden and this is the lowest burden you've got a gap what you're going to get a lot of is a ton of reports getting sent back by the prosecutor to the police officer to say i need more investigation because you didn't investigate this to beyond a reasonable doubt you investigated it to a lower burden that i can't operate on right so that policy for law enforcement is going to have to get beefed up in order for it to position the prosecutor to do the job you expect them to do right so policy protocol and structural changes are are core um, to a, to an actual coordinated response um, a solid understanding of how agencies organize workers right so we're going to talk about um, uh, probably tomorrow maybe on uh, beginning of day three how do institutions organize workers um, to, to basically do their jobs, right? And, and when we go in and we've got a new idea that we want a, a policy around, right? Then we have to account for all those different, eight way, those eight different ways in which that agency has organized these workers, right? Um, the resources, how they're linked to other agencies, the mission, that they're operating by the administrative tasks that support what they do all of that has to be accounted for and if it isn't then it's likely that it won't work something will fall apart and then somebody will point a finger and say well that agency isn't picking up their end well but you didn't actually make sure that the resources were in were in place for them to to execute the policy right um because you didn't account for it right so um we'll talk about all of that and 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 and, and get our heads around all the different ways that we need to organize within an agency to make sure that our, our responses are sustainable. Um, evaluating the effectiveness of those changes. Okay, so we've spent all, we spent two years working on this thing. How do we make sure that it actually has the intended outcome that we were hoping for, right? We just didn't do it. We're gonna do it to make sure it worked, right? Um, and then, um, continue the process. I mean, we've been doing this for 41 years. What Ellen and, and Coral um, and Shirley organized uh, in 1980 with, with our local government agencies, they couldn't have imagined what we have today, right? Because we've been building on that ever since. It's like an onion skin. Every time you peel an onion, uh, a layer off, you can see problems that were not visible to you before you fix this problem. And then you fix that problem and then new problems that become visible to you that you couldn't see before. All right, next slide, Jeff. Continuing with foundations, right, of organizing. Identifying a time and a person to do this work, right? This is not a part-time volunteer job. You're gonna have to find a way to get the resources in your community to give somebody the time to do this organizing. A lot of communities will take, take an advocate, for example, who is doing frontline advocacy and then this work. I can tell you that that so often fails because frontline advocacy will pri be prioritized time and time again, and there'll be no time for this organizing work. This takes time. It takes conversations. It, it takes a lot of reading, right? Policies, law, understand watching people do their work asking the question like it's just you can't just do this tuesdays and thursdays in a week right this is going to take somebody time so how is your community going to rally what grant are you going to write what sustainable source of funding are, are you going to draw from to be able to support somebody to do the to do this organizing work because as you can most of you know who've been part of teams for many years um that just being part of a team and showing up at a meeting once a month does not change a lot, right? Um, it's gonna take some intentional work outside of that meeting to do that. Um, system mapping, a solid understanding of each agency. When I go talk to judges, I have a language web that I use. When I go talk to prosecutors, I have a different one. When I talk to law enforcement, I have a different one because they all have their own culture that they operate from. I have to understand what that is. If I want to be heard in any one of those venues, I got to know how I got to be, how to present in a way that I will be heard, 
right? Um, because they're all different. I have to know those differences. So I have to develop allies within those systems, right? Child protection, um, they're, it's fascinating to me because they're, they're one of the most collaborative uh, groups of people in a sense. But when you start talking to individuals who do the work, they feel like they are alone. Like the decisions they make on a family that if somebody gets hurt, it's all gonna be all their fault, right? Um, that's a real thing. If they don't take the kids from a house, they gotta go back to a team that can be highly critical of, of not pulling that kid because that's the one way to guarantee, at least for the time being, that a child's not gonna get hurt, right? That is a culture that has to be understood and addressed as you're organizing people in that space. That's a whole lot different than a police department, right? So um, again, knowing what all of those differences are so that you can navigate those and be heard and be effective in each of those spaces. Um, relationships with decision makers, frontline workers, developing allies. Every one of the agencies that you have in your community have people that will go the extra mile for this work. Most won't, but find those who will. So I can call up a judge and say, hey, I got to present an idea to the bench at the bench meeting. What's the best way for me to do this? How should I present it? What should I say? What should I avoid, right? Um, and if I know what motivates them, I have a way to do that. Law enforcement, this is a, this is a recommendation for a new policy on arrest. How can we present this in a way to command that's going to, to help us out, right? Um, to get this thing to move. Your allies will help you understand and make a bridge to that culture because they're in it 24 seven, right? That's what they do. Trust. The greatest commodity I have is that people know that if they tell me something in confidence, it will stay there, right? As an organizer working in multiple agencies, if you don't have trust, it's a different line of work, right? Um, those of you know that who work in government systems, you can say something on one end of the courthouse in the morning and by in 15 minutes, it's on the other end of the courthouse, right? That's just how it works there. So um, I remember a judge, a new judge telling me, um, he, he said, I'm gonna tell you something and I know who knows what I'm gonna tell you. If it ever comes back to me, we're done, right? I'm an elected official. I like being a judge. I, I'm not going to be undermined by telling you something that you're going to go out and tell somebody else, right? Um, so I got people calling me all the time saying, I think there's a problem you should look into. That's, I, that is the lifeblood of an organizer, is information, right? People, what people will show you, what people will tell you, right? I have to be able to keep that confidence, right? Because they have a world they got to go back into in their agency and they don't want to be marginalized within that space, right, by their colleagues. But they're an ally to the process because they believe in what we're trying to accomplish, right? Strategy. It, what I would almost suggest, which I always, always really suggest in any state, and I know there's a lot of people from New Mexico here, but there's places, uh, also other states represented, that within your state, the people who do this work you should have a once, a once a month, once every other month call to talk about the strategy stuff that you're trying to accomplish because this is difficult work to do in, an, in a vacuum. You're sitting there wondering, should I bring this group and this group into the meeting? Because a lot of times you have one bite at the apple. And if you, if you mess it up, you don't get to go back and pick another apple. It's done, tree's, tree's empty, right? So you have to make the right decision that at that point um, in, a, in, a, in a lot of these different situations you're in. To do that in a vacuum, like I said, is difficult to do. I've done it. Um, it is so much easier to sit down with a team of people and say, this is what I'm struggling with. Any ideas on how anybody had a success with that I can draw from? You need support um, to do this organizing work. All right, Jeff, next slide. So 
how do communities define CCR? Um, uh, typically it's different than what I'm gonna be talking about, but there's collaboration. If, 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 if you talk to most of the domestic violence directors of, of shelters in Minnesota, they will tell you that they have a CCR and it's because when they call people, they call them back. <laughs> okay. That's not a CCR, that's a return phone call, right? Um, that, that's collaboration maybe, right? That you come to a meeting together, you do things together, but nobody is actually changing what they do. They're gonna continue to do what, they, what, they, what they've been doing up until that point. Um, you may complain about it, you may challenge it, but nobody actually is there to change what they do. Um, they're there to talk about the struggle typically that they have with the people that, you're, that are calling for help, right? Um, and that, that's just, that doesn't change anything. And that leads to a lot of people just bleeding off and not coming back to the meeting. Integration is taking that, uh, that collaboration a step further. And that, that's where folks actually might go out on calls together. So if there's a 911 call to a domestic and law enforcement's going out, they may call an advocacy agency and an advocate uh, will come out to the scene, right? So now it's integrated, but still the advocate's doing what the advocate thinks is best. The police officer's doing what the police officer, officer thinks is best. Everybody's doing what they think they, they should be doing. Nobody's actually trying to link what that officer is doing and what that advocate's doing at the scene to position the next player in that system who's gonna grab that case, right? That's, that's, it stops there. So when I'm in Australia, they actually, their, their formal way of talking about what we're all here to try to figure out is called an integrated response. So after two years, I, I finally asked the question because I just assumed that integrated was just another word for coordinated, but it wasn't. It was actually, so here I'm sitting in a meeting with a bunch of government agencies. And the year prior when I was there, one of the big gaps that I had identified was that they did an information share across government agencies. Nobody knew what the other agency knew, right? So they passed a law that allowed for information sharing between government agencies. And most of it came from court administration, the information, right, by statute. So I asked the court administrator, the representative, from court, court administration, I said, so tell me now, you can now pass information, how do you do that? And she said, well, we have a list of everything we can share and we push it out to every agency we can share it with. Okay, so that's integrated, right? I said, now, if we were gonna coordinate that, if we were gonna ramp it up even one step further, here's what we would do in Duluth. If a law was passed that says you could share this information before we ever got to the point where you did, I would go to you and I'd say, so tell me what information you can share. Give me the list of things. Show me what that looks like in your system. And then I would go to each agency that was gonna receive that and say, this agency can share this information. What of this list do you need? When do you need it to be effective in the work that you're doing? And what format do you need it put in so that you can actually use it? And then I would go back to court administration and say, okay, you can't just push 10 things to this agency because they don't need 10 of them. They only need two of them. And, when they, and, and this is when they need them, and this is the format that they need it in, right? Now you've actually got a coordinated response because you've actively engaged in coordinating how that information shared, you just don't push it out, right? Again, that takes work, right? So collaboration would be, I would say the, 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 um, the beginning way that people begin this work uh, to start, they start collaborating. Then they might start integrating, um, working together on different cases. But coordinating, it takes a whole nother level of organizing um, to get to. And again, this could be with entirely within uh, community-based agencies. Um, when I was working up in, in Ontario, Western Ontario with indigenous communities, they said, we don't have the resources that you have to be able to, to pull together what, what you have in Duluth, for example. And 
the 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 crown is 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 in some ways like um, the BIA, BIA would be in in indigenous communities in the United States. Um, so we can't organize with that. They don't. This isn't an open conversation. But what we want to do is organize within our community, so that our community-based agencies are all creating safety and accountability um, within our own boundaries, right? Um, so again, it doesn't have to, I'm going to use a lot of examples working with government agencies, but it doesn't have to be just in a government agency. You can do this outside of government agencies if that, if they aren't on the table for change, right? All right, next slide, Jeff. So the Duluth model, um, as David mentioned earlier, this is a brief definition of it. Um, basically, it's taking the lived experience of those who suffer the violence and using that experience as a way to inform how your system should respond. As opposed to us as experts sitting at a table deciding what they need, right? And I can assure you that if you sit down in a focus group and you ask uh, victims in your community what it's like when these systems intervene in their life, they will have a whole list of things to tell you about what does not work, right? And until you ask, you will not find out, right? Um, and we're gonna have all kinds of examples of that uh, that we're gonna work with uh, going forward in this training. All right, next slide, Jeff. All right, so in the 19, late 1970s, early 80s, um, the activists were trying to deal with the problem of, um, of domestic violence in the home, of intimate partner domestic violence. And the political word that came out of the women's movement at the time was battering. Um, that's what they called that kind of violence. And they went to the state and the argument to the state was the state's responsibility is to protect its citizens. There's a whole group of people who are not being protected because when they call for help, law enforcement does not have the ability uh, or does not take the responsibility, in other cases, to pull somebody out of the house and make somebody safer. They don't do that. They just ask the guy to walk around the block, right? So we, we want the state to take charge of this particular offender like they take charge of other kinds of offenders in our community. People who commit arson, people who rob, uh, people for, for like banks or whatever. Um, people who commit crimes in our community, the state takes responsibility for it, but there's, this whole, there's a crime occurring in a home where you just don't deal with it, right? So domestic violence laws, assault laws starting getting passed, now they're in most all 50 states, why is this important to this work we're doing here? Because there are different types of domestic assault that fall under all of our statutes. In Minnesota, if a cellmate in prison gets into a fight with their cellie, that's a domestic assault under our statute. That's not why we're here to organize, right? So under the, under the, the law of domestic assault, how are you going to distinguish between the intimate partner violence, right? Violence that victims use because they're being um, experiencing ongoing abuse, right? And then everything else, right? Because in a system, one of the big struggles is if domestic assault is the crime, then it all looks the same to me. As a, as a prosecutor, for example, right? So let me give you an example in Duluth. Guy has, this is the third police call to this house. This guy this time has beat her. She's bleeding from her eyebrows, her nose, her mouth, blood smeared all over her face, okay? They get him in cuffs, they secure the scene. The minute the scene is secure, she picks up a coffee cup off the table throws it at him and hits him in the cheek. That's an assault, right? There's no imminent threat of danger. 
There's no claim of self-defense that could be made. That's an assault. So she now gets taken into custody. Okay? you got two misdemeanor domestic assaults. Now those cases, let's say in this instance, it was a dual arrest. They take both people in. What does the prosecutor do when they've got two, when they got a dual arrest? Anybody who's a prosecutor knows that dual arrests are a nightmare, right? Because if she pleads guilty, which victims often do up front, then the prosecutor's got a guilty plea in one case and a not guilty in another, right? So either you just send them home, give them both disorderly conducts, basically nothing changes, right? We have to position the prosecutor to ask the question, what does justice mean for this misdemeanor domestic assault? And what does justice mean for this misdemeanor domestic assault? Because they're different, right? It's not trying to excuse or make any kind of violence okay, but it's trying to say that somebody has been experiencing ongoing violence by somebody else, and then they fight back or they act out of revenge. That's a different analysis for what is justice versus somebody who's been beating somebody into submission for years, right? But if you don't position the prosecutor, if you don't give them the tools to do that, then it's gonna be, it's gonna be a struggle because what's their filter? It's a fairness issue. I got two misdemeanor domestic assaults. You mean I'm gonna treat one misdemeanor one way and another misdemeanor another way? What's my legal justification for that? We have to be able to answer that. So Jeff is gonna put uh, an article, um, <laughs> Jeff's looking at me. <laughs> Jeff's gonna put an article in the chat. Um, it's a link to an article that Mary Asmus, one of our local uh, prosecutors, wrote up to help prosecutors think through that. And those of you who are not prosecutors, um, what you'll get from it is you'll understand what their lens is um, as a practitioner in your CCR, right? What, what is the thing that motivates a prosecutor? What are the things that they have to care for when they do their work, right? And you're gonna get ideas on how to position that, that, um, that, that, that particular role within your CCR to make determinations of justice. Now, advocates are gonna point the finger and say to the police officer, you shouldn't have arrested that person. But I can't go to a police officer and say, ignore the law. I can't do that. They're gonna go and they're gonna take that person into custody or give a citation, one of the two, because she broke the law. The question is what should happen because of it? That's not law enforcement's job. That's the prosecutor's job. So again, understanding the role of each player in the community and how to organize each one to deal with complex problems like that, rather than just blaming the police for uh, arresting somebody you think that they shouldn't have because we know what the situation was. It's not how it works, right? All right. Any thoughts or questions up to this point? Um, Are we good? Okay, all right. Next slide, Jeff. So what we've done is we've broken it down for our system players this way. There's battery and coercive control, right? That's somebody who's gonna beat somebody into submission because they wanna dominate their intimate partner. There's the resistive violence that comes out of that relationship. And then there's everything else that falls under the statute, right? Why is this important? It helps people in the system understand that there's different ways to think about the crime and domestic assault. It gives traction to the idea that we need to have a different response when we're dealing with somebody who's using um, uh, like a victim defendant who comes into the system versus somebody who is an ongoing offender of domestic violence. The other thing that it, that it um, helps us understand is that when, say for example, um, you're a probation agent like James Henderson used to be, um, <laughs> I see it now that James, <laughs> um, if you got a caseload, your most dangerous folks on your domestic caseload are gonna be ones committing acts of intimate partner violence. That's where we want you to spend your energy. I want you to spend less energy 
on the two brothers who got who were drinking one night and were fighting over who's going to use use dad's car right i don't want to put that much energy into that those folks i want to put my energy into where the ongoing threat is right but if we again if we ask probation to take on every single version of a domestic assault all of those non-intimate partner domestic things that come up most of them are going to divert energy time and attention away from where all the, the risk is right so again this helps people siphon out where we want them to spend their time right um police officers in duluth when they're asking the risk questions if it's a non-intimate partner domestic assault those questions don't have to be asked that saves them time but if it's an intimate partner domestic assault then all of those questions have to be asked by policy right because those are where the, that's where the real danger lies um, under domestic assault uh, cases in our communities next slide jeff so battering course of control this is somebody who is acting out of a place where he is trying to dominate their intimate partner through tactics like intimidation violence um, uh, coercion threats all of these different tactics that get named um, he's using those things to take her autonomy away from her, right? To dominate uh, his intimate partner. And it isn't a single incident. It's an ongoing process um, that he may not be using violence or very violence even uh, less frequent um, than say the average case, but it's still, he's instilled the fear to the point where he can control her through coercion um, or coercive control. Next slide, Jeff. So in these cases, when you're organizing agencies to intervene, you have to position them to collect context, not just the incident, right, that happened, but the context around it, because that's going to, this is a contextual crime. It's not an incident-based crime. The incidents that you end up getting report, that get reported are just the tip of the iceberg of what's been going on. We need the iceberg, not just the tip of it, right, to understand. So in Duluth, our police reports are, are 10 to 21, 10, 10 to 20 some page long reports. That's a lot of evidence. So when you get done reading that as a men's program person, as a pretrial release agent, as a judge, you have a lot of evidence that got collected at the scene about what this individual did and what's it like for her to live with him ongoing, right? The context of the violence. When we don't get the context of the violence, it leads to inappropriate responses where victims who use violence end up getting treated the same way as offenders, right? And they're not the same. There's a whole different mindset. Here's an example. Um, this is in a Western state. Uh, and the judges in this community, they got together, the community got together and created the CCR and they did a nice job. And a lot more people were getting held um, in custody because of this, of this new way that they were approaching domestic violence uh, uh, calls for help. The judges independent of the CCR decided as a bench to get together because their problem with the new way of doing things was that it was filling up their dockets and their dockets were too full. So they wanted to reduce the docket load. That was the goal, right? Reduce the docket load. So what they did is they created a diversion program. So when you come into your first appearance at arraignment, plead not guilty, at your next hearing, you, if you'd never had another domestic arrest, you'd be offered a diversion, right? But because they didn't work with advocates, because they didn't work with people who understood the problem, right? What they didn't know is that the way they designed it, when women ended up getting arrested, because there was a ton of dual arrests going on in this community, the women primarily were the ones who were pleading guilty at arraignment. And the reason the advocates found out that they were doing that is because a lot of them had kids who were at home with him and they didn't want their kids to be alone with their partner any longer than they had to. So they would say anything basically 
is what they said. I'll say whatever it takes to get me out of here, right? The men almost entirely as a group who were being arrested did not plead guilty at arraignment. They got to the next hearing. So when you looked at who ended up in diversion and who ended up getting convicted, it was mostly victim defendants getting convicted of domestic assault and men ending up in the diversion program. That was not the goal, but the design was faulty because it didn't understand the problem, right? And the problem that was trying to be solved was not a safety or accountability, it was a docket load. Let's solve the docket load, right? All right, next slide, Jeff. Oh, sorry, there's a hand up. Uh, Matt. Hi there, yes, thanks. Um, going back a, a moment of what you were saying about the context is critical. So are you describing that the system actually knows how to document bullying from one partner to another? Well, no, they don't know how. You have to, you have to help them with that, right? So you got to position them with questions that have to be asked to get at context, right? So, what's the, so you're there because of a, of a let's, say she, let's say a woman calls and um, her husband's been breaking stuff up. And she's scared that something physical is going to happen to her. So she gets on the phone, police show up. No crime has been committed there, right? But law enforcement's required to ask, what's the most dangerous thing he's ever done to you, right? Which may not be that night. It may be something else, right? Um, has he ever forced you to be, um, uh, forced you to do sexual acts that you did not agree with, right? Um, does he ever show up at places that you're unexpected? Does he, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Getting at the context, some of the risk factors that they, that they display that are pretty common. Those are the questions. We'll cover those questions so you'll get them. But without those questions being asked at the scene, we would know, like our whole risk evaluation is found, founded on the, on the answers that victims give to those questions. So that's kind of how we build that context in, right? What was happening before he, he got violent? What did you do after? What did he do after, right? Really getting the context of what happened as opposed to just basically what one of my uh, law enforcement friends who does training says, become the PC ranger, right? I'm going to come in. I'm going to determine probable cause. The minute I get to it, I pull the person and I'm out, right? Um, we need more information than that to really know who we're dealing with, right? Yeah. Does that help, Matt? Sort of. <laughs> okay. The conversation locally that we're having is that the, the normalization of bullying and of non-physical violence, when people are asked, are you in a, are you safe? Are you in an abusive thing? We've normalized what bullying is. So then we say, sure. And we've just normalized it versus knowing the, the really bad context that's going on because blood isn't happening. It doesn't, you, on those incidences are getting recorded. However, all the context up to that is not because of this normalization that's happening. And so your talk about the, yes, I agree that the context is critical. I'm wondering how that, how the system absorbs that somehow, but we'll get there, hopefully. Yeah, so when we start talking about how, so like, for example, somebody who was arrested last night in Duluth, that report now shows up on my uh, uh, colleague Stat Pat's computer at the police department. She sits down, downloads that report. She's gonna take all the risk information collected by law enforcement, and she's gonna, analyze that and distribute it within a format that the prosecutors can now use. The answers to those risk questions often, let's say the case goes to trial. The prosecutor will probably take those, likely take the answers to those questions out of anything the jury is going to end up seeing because it's going to talk about events, not about that night, right? But it's going to help the prosecutor know, okay, I've got a guy who's really dangerous here, right? So how do I want to proceed with this? What's my pretrial release argument for supervision or not, right, um, for this individual? It's going to help them make determinations pretrial and post-conviction about what to do with them. Yeah. 
and then help advocates understand how dangerous it is for her. Help men's program people understand the history of what he's done, right? So everybody just knows more when the context is, is, is gathered. So it's just not domestic assault. Yeah, okay. Okay, um, if you want to. Okay, so then, then there's a question in the chat. What about narcissistic traits and control without violence making it harder to prove? Yeah, so I th we don't have coercive control laws like there is being, like there is in, in some other countries right now um, that are new. Um, although in Minnesota, we can, we can prosecute on fear alone. We don't need physical violence to happen. Just instilling fear is enough for us to be able to, um, to prosecute. Um, the thing I would caution about the narcissistic, uh, the word narcissism, is that again, that's a lens to thinking about the problem. And most men who use this violence are not narcissists. Um, everybody on Facebook is a narcissist, I know that. <laughs> There's a whole definition that comes out of social media. Um, but a narcissist isn't gonna change. That's who they are, right? The men that commit most of this violence that we're talking about can change, right? They've been socially constructed to be who they are. They can unlearn what they've learned. Um, you're not going to do that with a narcissist. So, but the traits that you're talking about, which is, it's all about me, right? What, what, what I want is the most important, um, uh, decision in this house to, 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 uh, organize around. Um, it's my money. It's my house. It's my kids. It's my car. Um, it's all that kind of my, my, my stuff. Um, in fact, one woman told me that her nickname for her partner, um, was a, 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 a seagull. And I said, why is that? And she said, because the seagulls in the movie Nemo, all they do is say, mine, 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 <laughs> right? So that, that's that narcissistic trait that I think you're talking about, right? Um, that is part of being entitled, right? That is what an entitled individual believes about the world and what he gets to do with the family that he has. Everything is mine. She's mine, kids are mine, everything's mine right? And it all revolves around, I'm the sun, everybody revolves around me, right? So that's the trait. Um, that's the kind of stuff that we need some context for, because it helps us understand the, the threat level that th this individual poses to his family. Because if that's who he is, then it's very likely that he's going to continue to do this if there's no intervention with him, right? So we need to know what those things are. That's where those risk and context questions really help. Yeah. And we're going to lay out what those are. So you'll see those. Um, we'll cover those tomorrow, actually. So, yeah. Good. Any other questions? Okay. Jeff. Um, uh, the, you, the last one there, emboldened perpetrators. When... When you've got a relationship of power, right? So you've got somebody at the top and somebody at the bottom. And the person at the bottom gets arrested, right? It emboldens the person at the top, right? Because it makes it easier for him to control her, right? It makes it easier for him to say to her that you're the problem, which is what he's been saying all along anyway. But now there's like institutional stamp of approval on his notion that the real problem is her, right? And it just emboldens his um, behavior in that relationship. And again, we're going to talk about that um, more coming up, but that's what we don't want to do. We want to do the opposite. We want to impact offenders uh, in a way that, that reduces their inclination to continue to be abusive, not embolden them to continue. Right. All right. Next slide, Jeff. So resistive violence, the violence that comes out of being in an abusive relationship includes both legal and illegal use of force. Um, so again, Marcus Bruning, who I've done a lot of law enforcement training with, and he's a law enforcement uh, trainer and officer, former officer. He said the, 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 the biggest crime in his experience that goes under-investigated is self-defense. 
in domestic assault cases when there's probable cause injuries on both parties, right? We just don't do it. The only time we tend to do it is when somebody gets a knife in the chest and there's severe response of violence, then we'll do a self-defense analysis. But in a typical domestic assault where both people have injuries, it doesn't happen, right? So that's the legal end of it. If you, everybody has a right to act in self-defense, we all have it, right? If I acted in self-defense, there is no crime, right? But if I didn't act in self-defense and it's illegal violence, right? Then I'm going to have the consequence of, of that to deal with, which is typically getting taken into custody or a citation. Um, but then what does justice mean for what I've done, which is actually the purview of prosecution? So um, the question to you and to your communities is, when a victim uses violence, how have you positioned officers? What tools have you given them to collect evidence in a way so that people understand the context of that, right? Or are they just simply, like I've been to communities where I'm looking at police reports and literally you can't tell, all you, can, all you know is that somebody hit somebody else. Their names, their address, and the time and the, and, and the date. That's basically what you see. It doesn't tell you one thing from the next person who, who committed an act of assault. There's no context. Next slide, Jeff. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna listen to um, a video of a woman named Natalie. And this comes from the Turning Points curriculum for working with women who are victim defendants um, uh, who've committed illegal acts of violence. What I want you to do is you're, is you're listening to Natalie's story. Think about what, what would have to happen in your community so that everybody would know the context of Natalie's use of a deadly weapon or deadly force against her partner, which is a knife, okay? And then think if you only arrested her for stabbing him and that's what the investigation revolved around, what would be the chances that the prosecution would not oppress charges, which was the case in this particular instance, right? So this is the problem. How do you link it to your CCR, right? Okay. Okay. So um, the question to you all was, to imagine if this happened in your community, what would be the response? What would be collected at the scene? What would we actually know about her story? What would we not know about? And what would that mean for her going forward um, through the system, right? So we, i sorry, I just missed your break by about eight minutes. Um, I'm doing time changes in my brain. <laughs> and when I had a little break there, I realized that I missed one. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to encourage, we'll take our break right now for 15. We'll put up a counter on the screen. So you know when to come back and then we'll have our conversation when we get, when we reconvene. All right. So have a good break and we'll see you soon. Okay. We are back. So we have a, a, a little screen save or a little thing we put up with our counter that just randomly picks uh, people's cameras from around the world and puts it up there. And that was Italy, that last one. That's not what I picture when I think of Italy, but that's, <laughs> that was Italy. All right. Um, okay. So uh, you've had a little time to digest and think about uh, any thoughts you have in regards to Natalie's story and your community's um, response. So um, any thoughts or comments or questions um, regarding that? How well would your community do collecting that information and what would they do with it if they did? This is Johnny in, in New Mexico. Hi Johnny. Uh, 
We had a similar incident happen to us where uh, the the victim, very, instead of stabbing, shot the individual. And the collection that we were able to obtain, the details of history, was paramount in the, dis in the district attorney being able to make a decision because at first the, the, the timeline went arrest, you know, the incident, the officers arrived, there's arrest, and then all these forensics took place, which took time to digest. And they were focused on that part of it, which was extremely important, blood splatter, the whole thing. But the history of what we were able to document, even to the injuries, she had some injuries to her private parts that she didn't disclose initially that we were able to go ahead and gather. But the totality of getting everything put together before the DA prevented her from going to the preliminary. It was very, it was very stressful. It was very, there was a lot of trauma placed on her because she was the true victim in this situation. It was, it, it resulted in, you know, he either killing her or she killing him. And uh, in self-defense, she protected herself, but Without that, I don't know if the DA would have made the decision not to prosecute. Now, this was a decision that didn't even go to a jury. This was something that he, you know, and, and I think that was how our, and we had a team together. We've had a TCR in place for, for some time, but we all worked together to get as much information, not only about the incident, but the history. And that is, that is very, very important. Right. I mean, that's, Johnny, you just described exactly what, we, what the goal is right here. But we don't want to just do it, do it when somebody pulls a firearm and somebody's dead, right? We want to do it when you've got two people with scratch marks on their face, right? Um, we want to apply that same thing. Because if you want to solve a problem, right, you're intervening in a problem. If you want to solve it, you have to understand where the violence is coming from. And where it's coming from in her is in a different place than where it's coming from him. It doesn't mean it isn't a problem, but it has to be addressed differently. And you have to know what that is, right? Um, so so if, if nobody ends up defining it, um, so here's a different lens. This is a case in, 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 in Minnesota. Now the prosecutor saw the problem very differently than what the information that Johnny talked about, how that influenced the way that prosecutor's lens looked at this case this prosecutor saw this as victims are constantly lying and i need to make an example of a victim so that they don't lie thinking that this is just a character flaw in victims as opposed to a strategy to keep herself safer right so instead of taking her statement from in victim with the victim witness person in the in the working for the prosecutor's office he put her in a hearing right, where she was under oath. And when she didn't tell the truth that he thought she should, he charged her with perjury, right? Now that's a very different lens for looking at who a victim is, right? Um, that's the kind of stuff that ends up happening in communities where they don't have a cohesive understanding of the problem. But a lot of what I think Johnny helped us understand is that what I said earlier, if you want people to make better decisions, give them better information to work for, work from, right? Yeah, good. Anyone else have a thought or a comment? Uh, Alexandria. Hi, good morning. Hi. Um, thanks for sharing that. That video reminds me, I used to work at the Public Justice Center in Baltimore and we had a film called A Plea for Justice, which was about um, survivors who had um, killed their abusive partners in self-defense and were serving life sentences. I'm sure you're aware of it. Um, mm -hmm. It makes me think about, you know, the need for our solutions to be intersectional as well. Um, I work um, in communities with mostly Black survivors here in New Mexico who um, were formerly incarcerated, whether it was, and, and they all pretty articulately identify the root cause of their incarceration being rooted in domestic and sexual violence. And what I learned directly from them is that calling law enforcement um, before a major event 
um, was not an option for them, right? And Beth Ritchie and so many others, Miriam Cobbett, mm -hmm. Survived and Punished, all of them have been saying this for, for decades, right? But I hear it every day that um, calling the cops for them is not an option because one, they are afraid of being rearrested and going back into the system or two of their partners being killed. Um, and so that documentation thread that Johnny was just talking about um, is not there, right, in that system. And so I'm just thinking about what other ways, who in community is accountable that can hold some of that knowledge, that can hold some of that history, um, because it just does not exist within this specific system that we're talking about today. Right, so then who do these women intersect with, right, in the, in, in the communities you work in? Um, so, as I said earlier, we were working with a, a, um, a group of folks in Hawaii. In it looks like indigenous he might folks have who are adapting our will. And so, from that, uh, from women, sorry, what they learned from women that they interviewed was that same thing as Alexandria said, calling law. Law enforcement was not an option for them because a place for them to voice the problem that they were experiencing either, right? So within the community, they're having to organize space for this conversation to take place so that the community can have, find a way to deal with it when it happens with, within. We had a similar example with, with uh, women who are experiencing ongoing domestic violence within the evangelical faith traditions in our community. They said in our focus groups that their 911 call was the pastor because they're not going to bring the secular community into their home. Okay. So on the, on the occasion that we would get one of those cases that would come up through the criminal system, it was because of a severe act of violence. And then to Alexandria's point, we wouldn't have this institutional record of previous arrests and all of, and calls for help because they didn't do that. Right. So we had to organize with the pastors that when this problem comes to you, because that was the other thing, the pastors were dealing with it in a way that was making it less safe for victims in a significant way. So we had to organize with them the way we organize with the criminal system. Right. Um, how, how do you understand the problem? Right. What are the solutions? So interestingly, what came out of that was that those pastors that chose to be part of this coordinated response became the probation agents for the offenders. And they were the ones that made the referrals to a Christian-based men's nonviolence program um, that happened in one of their churches, right? Member, member churches. And the guys who came into our program for their intake before they got to that, because we did all the tracking of, of, those, of those cases, had to put their, their pastor down the way that anybody else would put their probation agent down. And then that pastor would get reports as to his compliance to the group that he was going to. And if he didn't go, he would be suspended back to the, pro the pastor. What we found that was interesting to us is that men's compliance to their pastor was stronger than it was their compliance to probation. <laughs> um, there was less uh, of, 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 of just taking off and not going to group. Um, but that's, that's an example of where if this is a group of women who are not gonna utilize government systems for help, then how do we coordinate who they do come in contact with? The community that they do live in, right? And it's all the same stuff, right? How do you hold him accountable? In fact, what, what, it got to the point where the guys were getting referred by, by pastors. Then they'd come to our program and we'd say, well, who's your pastor? and What's your church? And they'd say, well, I'm currently unaffiliated <laughs> because they didn't want the accountability for their pastor to know that they decided not to go to the group, right? Um, so that ended up being a meaningful way to leverage them into a program that they didn't want to be in, which is always the struggle 
in men's re uh, uh, rehabilitation when it comes to, to ongoing domestic violence cases. Um, and then there was a group for women that happened within the church for, who were victims of this violence so that they could have a voice within that space to talk. So does that, I mean, I know a lot of my examples are gonna be government because most of that's what the work in this room is gonna be, but it, by no means uh, do I wanna make it um, limited to government agencies. So does that help Alexandria or does that? Yeah, thanks Scott. It's helpful for me to just like, you know, hold that. Um, and your the example, some of the examples you gave, gave, I think were great. It's just important for me to hold that, um, to remember that some of these systems we work in every single day, don't they don't respond to many, many people. Um, and so I appreciate just the invitation to like think about other ways of um, building in that accountability. Yeah, yeah, and, and and the interesting thing to me doing this work and all the different places that have tried to replicate it and all the different kinds of communities or systems that they applied it to was that there was just no community that didn't need organizing <laughs> to respond better to the problem. Um, yeah, so uh, these principles that we're talking about, these foundations of organizing all apply, whether it's government or non-governmental kinds of responses that you're, that you're involved in. And I would, if, I mean, one of the fascinating things to me, Alexandria, is if you sat down with 20, 30 of these women that you work with and just asked them, um, like, where would be a place that you go that you would call for help, right? Like, what is that? Is it, is it, is it, is it churches? Is it, um, is there, is there places that they're getting um, um, resources from, right? That they would feel comfortable. Like where, where should I start my organizing um, in our community to help you have a voice and be able to, a space to say what is happening to you and then have some meaningful outcome because you took the risk to say something. Yeah, uh, James. I'm just going to build on what both of you are talking about. We had a similar case where it was a woman on probation and she had stabbed, cut her partner with a machete, but years and years of ongoing chronic abuse that she had received, but she had never called the police and nor would wow. she. <clears throat> she did not want him deported back to Saudi Arabia. She was hopeful that she would be able to get to a point where she could go back and she would prefer he stay here. Mm -hmm. um, and we really were able to work with... Um, the people from, uh, you know, the, uh, the mosque and her, her religion. And they actually came one day, he was trying to break in her house at three o'clock in the morning. She was able to call, I forget what they call their, their religious leaders, but, um, you know, a bunch of men from their faith came and got him. They took him and they kind of surrounded him with love, but accountability too. Like you're going to get deported. This is what's going to happen to you. You don't want the system getting involved. And so they provided her safety and support but it was also people that he respected and would listen to. So it was interesting when you said that, Scott, how the men listened to their ministers more than probation. He certainly listened to the men of his religious institution um, far more than he would of the criminal justice system. And then the consequences to her, if we use the criminal justice system, just she did not find acceptable. So, you know, finding that mm -hmm. community partner. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. Excellent examples. Right, right. That's great. Perfect. All right, all right. Well, we will continue, Jeff, next slide. All right, so if you know the experience of survivors, the invitation I just gave Alexandria, right? If you know um, the lived experience of what is happening to them, how he's using um, the culture in which he's in to leverage uh, her compliance, right? How he's justifying it. Um, and you know the characteristics of the abuser, right? Who he is, how he uses tactics, what tactics he does use, how he justifies them, how he presents. And then you know what NGOs or government agencies are in that community available to respond if they were positioned correctly. Now you have the foundation to start figuring out what, are, what, what you can do in your community to help the many communities that are in most of our larger cities, right? Find a way to have space for a voice, 
um, to say this is what's happening to me and meaningful um, consequence to the person who is uh, committing the abuse, right? Um, give you an example just on when I say, I'm gonna use this word meaningful consequence um, because again, one of the things that I learned when I was doing some work in Australia is that a lot of what was happening over there was a $300 fine for, for breaking a protective order. And it was not meaningful. The advocates would tell you flat out, the recidivism rate is off the charts um, because a $300 fine isn't enough to prevent him, to make him think twice about committing another act of violence. Whatever leverage you use has to be meaningful to the person that you're using it um, toward. Again, another example um, in another country, in England, they were, this is up by Durham, they were experimenting in that police jurisdiction with a, with a procedure where if they had the evidence to take somebody into custody, they would go to the house of the offender, knock on the door and say, we have the evidence to take you into custody and prosecute you for domestic assault. But we're not gonna do that if you go to this rehabilitation program. If you go to the rehabilitation program, not only will you not get arrested, but um, you also get to keep your housing. But if you don't go to this program, not only will we take you into custody, but we will also take your housing, right? So housing is a right there. Um, it's not a right here in the United States, but it is a right there. And so that was meaningful leverage to get him to go to a program he didn't want to go to, right? And that's always the struggle. What is the meaningful leverage? Um, and some of the folks I've talked to in Western Ontario, indigenous communities, part of the leverage was you don't get to live in our community, right? You're gonna be, you'll be told to leave and it's a flying community. So um, it's not like you can just drive in and out, right? So if you, your family's here, um, if you wanna stay here, then you need to stop with the violence um, and do what we ask you to do to, to change. Um, again, a non-governmental, way of creating leverage for somebody who, um, who wants to be in that community but is acting uh, violently against one of its members. So, yeah. All right, next slide, Jeff. So what we're gonna do, kind of just to get into this power and control kind of uh, mindset and idea that the wheel kind of gives us as a lens is to do an exercise. And so what we're gonna do is listen to a group of women who volunteer their time um, to talk about the things that men did to them. What I want you to do is jot down um, on a piece of paper all the things that you hear women say their partners did to them, okay? And then once you have that list together, we'll come back and we're gonna do something in small group with that. So um, gather what, what these women talk about and we'll come back and, uh, and, and work with it, all right? Anybody have a question about what we're gonna do? Okay, great. Um, see you in a minute. He'd um, slap me, hope he punched. Um, he used to grab my arms so tight. I'd leave, he'd leave like little handprints in black and blue farms. Um, if I, you know, stood up to him, while he was trying to beat me down like a dog, he'd start throwing things, breaking things. And his favorite thing was strangling. And I got in my van and I had her in reverse. I had the van in reverse, but he was so relentless and he didn't want to let it go. He scared me by punching my van so hard that he put a big dent in the hood. It was always somebody else's fault, never his. It, it was my only thought the whole time he was driving was the first chance I get, I am, I gotta get out of this car. And I opened up the door and as I started to try and lean out, um, he grabbed me by the back of the, of the hair, grabbed me by the back of the head and um, whipped me around inside the car and started driving. Um, unbelievably fast, um, whipping around the parking lot. And I still had the door sort of open because um, I just kept saying, you know, just let me go, just stop the car, please just stop the car. 
and he was, you know, whipping me around the car and, um, you know, by my head and, you know, screaming at me, you know, you better fucking shut that door. Otherwise, you know, you're really going to see what's going to happen. You, you know, you better just fucking just shut the door. And I just remember thinking, if I shut the door, it's not going to get any better. Either I would get the story about how he's really just like a hurt little boy and he never means anything he says. He's just like a little boy having a tantrum and he just wants to be heard and he just wants to, his feelings to be felt, but he doesn't ever mean the things he says. Um, or else again, it would be that I'm crazy. Um, you know, you just, you know, you twist it around and, you know, you just turn it into something weird. I don't even know how your, how your mind works because you, how you could take something and just make it into something so warped. He uh, um, had a certain stance he would get when he was upset, um, body gestures, um, but especially just even his presence, you would feel it, you could feel it change in the room. He would, um, if he was upset, especially he would get right up in your face. He would come almost nose to nose with you. Um, and he wasn't very tall, so he would be right up um, in my face. Um, and, uh, his voice, you know, his voice would go up, um, but it really was, um, uh, um, almost, almost kind of like a bird or something, you know, he would almost kind of just puff up. He would, you know, get up in your face and he'd just assume this presence that you knew meant business. Something strange would happen. It would be something to do with him. Um, and if I questioned it, he would go off in front of me, in front of the kids, and he would scream at me about how, you know, you see, see, it's your mind again, you know, your fucking mind is just warped, and, and you take this shit, and you rat, and you twist it in your sick mind, and, you know, you're crazy, and you're this, and you're that, and you're this, and I knew it, everybody warned me about you, you know, your friends talk about how crazy you are, and they all they all know it and, and they're just, they just don't want to tell you because they're afraid to have to tell you, but you know, they all, they call me and they tell me all about you and, you know, and you're just sick. You're a sick person. You shouldn't even be around my children. And really after I got married, um, it started changing pretty quickly. Um, eventually I would invite people to my house, even just a few close friends. And he would sit in his room and never come out and so eventually my friends didn't want to come because they liked me but nobody wanted to come to the house because it just was too awkward if I would suggest us going out um you know he's too tired or you know it, it just there was always another reason why or um oh I don't have the money right now or um I, I quickly stopped doing things alone with my girlfriends because it just became too much of a headache um you know, either he had some reason why he suddenly, you know, it'd be famous for him to go out the door and suddenly, oh, he got called away for business. He suddenly had to go to a job and he suddenly couldn't watch the kids. So I'd have to bail um, or I'd get home. And then, of course, it would be another one of like the screaming, you know, I matches where eventually it just became, it became pointless. It was like, this is so much work for me to do this that it's just not even worth it. Um, another time was I was pregnant with my dad with our daughter and I got out of school a little later than I was supposed to and he hit me in the head with a bottle and threw a TV literally in my stomach I was eight months pregnant with our daughter he would put me down tell me that, uh, oh, you're ugly, call me names, nobody will want you. Or if I would, we would go out together, he would just say little things to me or talk to other women in my face. And I was told not to say anything. It's, it got pretty bad. He locked me in our apartment. He put a deadbolt lock on the door. Therefore, I could not get out because he had the key. He had locked it from the outside. And I would, I would be in that apartment for days. 
seeing nobody. It was never his fault. It was always, you made me do it. If you'd have just did what I told you to do. He denied, he denies ever being violent. Total denial. Are you kidding me? Look at my face. You're not violent? Once he wanted me to have a sexual relationship with his brother in front of him. And I chose not to do that. So therefore, I was beaten with a clothes hanger and burnt with cigarettes. And I also was cut on my back with a razor blade. He says, you know, I've never hit you. And um, so I don't know why you're there. I don't know. I've never done anything wrong to you. I've been a great husband. Many women would love to have me for a husband. Um, you know, before I'd asked for maybe marriage counseling, he's like, well, I could give marriage counseling. He thinks that he is, he thinks he's this perfect, great image of this husband. Yet he thinks that it's all in my mind that I'm imagining things and I'm exaggerating things. I mean, the look in his eyes, it was almost like, I don't want to say it looks to kill, but I mean, that's how it looked to me that if he wanted to, he could have just like done something to me and not would have thought anything of it. Um, when he was like that, he would um, a lot of times threaten suicide throughout our whole marriage. And he'd get so angry. He'd like kind of go back and forth between being really rageful from the next second, like Dr. Jekyll and Hyde. It was like, then he'd be wailing and weeping. It was just like, I didn't know from what second to the next, what the mood was going to be. And that was what was so scary is I didn't know what side was going to um, He views himself as being more um, smarter or wise, being that he is the head of the house. God has given this like special insight or wisdom, and um, I need to accept that 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 that's just the way it is, and I need to follow him blindly and willingly, and um, and that's that's basically what I did. I was, I could say I was brainwashed into believing what he was saying about all that all these years. About four years ago, he had this whim that we were just going to move to um, the middle of nowhere out in Vermont on 16 acres took me and the th three, we had three kids at the time. And he even admitted to me that he was taking me there and us ki and the kids to take me away from my family and to separate me. And that right there kind of was a small wake up call at that time. It was like the first warning sign that this was, this wasn't right. And, um, the second one was, he told me I could not go to my sister's wedding. I did not go to my sister's wedding. And he justified that um, by stating he knew it was best for me spiritually. So Jeff, you wanna pull up the next slide, please? Okay. So in your small groups, what we want you to do is talk about what that list that you put together link it to the power and control wheel. And as you do that, start paying attention to what kind of themes that you see um, playing out, things that you notice as you're linking all of these different abuse tactics to the power and control wheel. Because essentially, this is how the wheel was put together. By asking women, when you're living with a man who's doing this to you, what are all the things that he does, right? And eventually it ends up in the, in the tactics on this, on this particular wheel. 
this exercise replicates that to uh, in, in a, like a Reader's Digest version. For those of old enough to know what Reader's Digest is, <laughs> um, I realize some of my references might be old. Um, okay, so uh, uh, um, any questions about what you're going to do in your small groups? Okay. Jeff will send the invitation and uh, you can have your conversation. We'll give you again about 10 minutes to have that conversation. If somebody would uh, uh, take notes and kind of kick it off for, the, for your group, um, that would be great. So we will see you in a, in a bit. Great, okay, we are back. All right, who would like to kick off the conversation for the group uh, on what things that you noticed? Linking I'll go these ahead. Different... Let's see, where are you? I'm Linda. So. There you are, Linda, I found you. <laughs> there's a lot of us now, huh? Yeah. Um, so uh, we were in room seven and we, I mean, we looked at the wheel and we all pretty much agreed that Every one of that, the parts of the pie, so to speak, um, was represented. I mean, we heard everything. Mm -hmm. And um, so we talked a little bit about that, the, the commonalities and everything. But um, yeah, just making that observation that we, we were able to identify with everything that was there. So. Yeah, so, so there's two kind of two sides to look at when you're understanding the wheel, right? These are the tactics that not, this is an all inclusive. There are tactics like spiritual abuse, for example, that are not on the wheel. So this is an all inclusive, but these are the tactics being used. How do they use them? If these are the tactics being used, how do they land on victims, right? So there's two real things to understand there, right? How do they get used? How do they get leveraged? And then what is the experience of living with that? Um, that, that kind of abuse. So two things to understand when you're trying to get to a cohesive way of operating as a team or as a coordinated response around this problem. So good. Thank you, Linda. Scott, you just mentioned something there that, that we um, observed that the religious ranking of head of household as a justification wasn't on the wheel. And I'm wondering maybe if you could say why that isn't on there. Because at the time this wheel was put together, that popular, in fact, it was about 15 years ago that we started doing that work in the Christian community, the evangelical Christian community. And those women weren't calling for help to the public agencies that we were talking about. So they weren't part of this work, right? But, but when we did do that work with them and created the, the wheels for them, the tactics stayed the same, but where they put it is under male privilege. Right. So I'm head of house. God gave me that that position to dictate to the family. Therefore, that's and that's where the women in those focus groups put that particular notion um, was under that tactic. So thanks, Matt. That's a good point. Yeah. Scott, I was in group number two um, and we got one, two, three, four, five we, and a start on a six category. Um, there was a little bit of conversation about the difference between using intimidation and being intimidated. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that um, uh, people um, would like some clarification on. Um, but uh, the we started with physical abuse and that kind of led to intimidation, the isolation, using... Uh, we broadened the category of uh, using children to using children and others, um, male privilege and sexual abuse, and it was it was a target rich environment, as they used to say. <laughs> right, right. Could you refine the question about the intimidation intimidated piece? To say, uh, yeah. Um, so it, when he's um, when when we heard the the women saying that um, he punched the car hood that is using intimidation. Um, and I'll, I'll, I don't have an example right off the top of my head that we talked about, but an example of whether or not that's intimidating may not, doesn't mean that he wasn't using intimidation. And somebody can be intimidated 
without somebody else using intimidation, uh, but the intentional use of intimidation by the perpetrator is really what the wheel is focused on, N not necessarily the effect on the survivor. Everything oh. on that wheel may in fact be intimidating to her, Correct. but it's different than using intimidation. Right, this is the intentional use of it. I'll give you an example though, David. Um, uh, this guy in men's group was frustrated because he felt like he was changing, right? So she's standing with the baby in the kitchen um, and he's making dinner and um, he realizes he needs something from a cupboard and he reaches up real quick to open up the cupboard to grab something and she flinched. Mm -hmm. Right now, he wasn't intentionally using it, but she was used to him doing that where he'd raise his hand and intimidate her. So she reacted. And then he got frustrated because he wasn't, that wasn't his intent, right? He didn't see that as a consequence of his past behavior. He thought she should be on board with him where he's at in that moment, which is, hey, I'm just making dinner and I'm not intimidating you. So if that helps a bit, right? Yeah, uh, um, absolutely. Yeah, this, is, this is the intentional use of it. But the consequences of this, which is her flinching when he's not, um, is the effect. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Very good. Anyone else want to share what they noticed? I'll speak. This is Carla. Hi, Carla. <laughs> Hi. Um, so some of the things that we had talked about um, we kind of agreed, everyone was familiar with the power and control wheel. So we all kind of agreed that pretty much each tactic was represented in the victim's um, stories. Um, so one of the things that we talked about though is how sometimes victims themselves may even um, struggle with labeling some of the um, behaviors and also minimize the abuse as well, especially if there has been no physical violence. So, you know, we'll say things like, but at least he didn't hit me. Um, you know, so just working on educating victims that, you know, right, using the wheel that not all power and control or not all violence has to be physical and that there are other um, tactics that can be used. So then that kind of also transpired into a conversation of cultural differences. Um, and it got brought up that in many Asian communities, there is not a direct translation of domestic violence. Um, so sometimes it can be very hard when you're working with different cultures who don't see domestic violence as anything but physical violence. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a couple of the, the main themes that we talked about. Also just kind of, you know, the wording, much like we're trying to get away from better, um, kind of same thing with the victim. Someone had mentioned, you know, they don't like using the word victim, um, rather an individual who is victimized by domestic violence and had kind of made this comment like, using the word victim, um, basically he is then creating that label for her, right? Because of his actions, he is creating that label for her. So even um, some headway in moving away from the victim wording, so. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's what the system's gonna use. Right. So you're not gonna change that, right? So right. you're gonna have to have that and I'm a, I, I'm a survivor, but I don't like the word survivor of domestic violence as a child and sexual abuse as a child because I did more than survive. I wanted to do more than survive, right? right. I did a lot of surviving early in my life. I didn't want to, right? So there's all this stuff around how we think about what we should and shouldn't do. Great conversations to have. Um, what the experience is though at its core is that this band of physical and sexual violence that goes around the wheel that's what women said the threat of or the use of holds these tactics together mm -hmm. right it makes these tactics play out in a different way so emotional abuse inside this system plays out differently than it would if this wasn't a threat or a use of right so if he calls me a name and i don't have any fear of him and he's never used physical violence that's going to be a conversation between us. But if he calls me a name and he's demonstrated his capacity to go that direction, even the woman, like you said, Carla, that said, um, well, at least he didn't hit me. Mm -hmm. Well, then it's a possibility. <laughs> like right. clearly that's on the landscape, right? Right. Um, yeah. So it's here. So when he 
threatens or uses physical or sexual violence against me and he uses these tactics what the women said it gives him this it gives him this power imbalance over me that and and i remember one of my most like we all have these moments doing the work where things just get branded in your memory and and they don't ever go and there was a woman in a focus group who said we were i think we were coming up with some sort of police policy or something and she said i don't i don't know which way it should go or i know what's better or worse but i can tell you this that in my life as a woman i always have to account for the power he has over me and if you whatever you develop whatever goals you have for change have to account for the power he has over me because if you don't i disappear right i don't because i never get to ignore what he can do or what he has done right so that was a charge to 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 us as a community of activists trying to figure out a way to change the way our system responds to never lose sight of the power he has over her um in all of our interactions and so if you go from from the front of our response to the back of our response you can see examples of how that's built in so in in police law enforcement response when they come into a home um whether it's a rural sheriff um by himself or herself or a pair of police officers that show up in in the city they do not interview the suspect within earshot of the victim because of this right um and i said earlier we want to organize for three things we want to make it safer we want to make him more able to hold him accountable and we want to make the job of the practitioner better that intervention designed as it it is does all three it makes it safer for victims to speak about what he's done outside of earshot of him it makes it easier to hold him accountable because the officer is going to get better evidence if he can't hear what she's saying and if she and if the officer gets better evidence there's going to be more likely that there's going to be a change or a possibility of change in that individual and if that's the case then that officer is going to be back to that house for the next you know for the rest of his career showing up for calls for to 911 right so um so that's what we're trying to achieve is understand this gives us a window into what he who he is and what's it like for her right and the other thing about the wheel is that these tactics using isolation emotional abuse intimidation privilege choosing children minimizing i and blame these are the tactics of oppression so when you see people oppressed around the world these are tactics that are being used um to execute that oppression um and a lot of the programs that we've partnered with to adapt this wheel um have have uh, uh really brought that home to us so there's a man in the twin cities um he's a dakota man a uh, member of the standing uh rock uh, tribe in in north dakota and he is a specialist in indian federal law his project is he's taking US federal law and showing how every one of these tactics are represented against indigenous people by US federal law and how that gets executed by the US government right um most of the places that uh like the group in Hawaii um that's doing an adaptation the power and control wheel tends not to change the tactics tend to stay the same because for them these are the tactics of the col- of colonization right what changes is what this wheel looks like based on culture that could be dramatically different but this is pretty much what is 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 one um one video i watched years ago had elders from an indigenous community i believe in south dakota talking about how do you want to take on the values of the cavalry or do you want to take on the values of our people right this is how oppression gets taught this wheel specifically is how men who batter use them right but they didn't invent these these existed long before that 
So that just gives you a sense too to help the team understand how deeply embedded is this problem, you know, in the culture that we are and how historical it is. As Ellen used to say, when a man slaps a woman across the face, we have to help him see that that's a historical act, right? It didn't happen in a vacuum, right? Uh, Matt, you've got your hand up. Well, as you as you talk about the the importance of when law enforcement interviews someone suffering from from violence at home, how often is this wheel used to put things in context? At the scene? Yeah. No. Well, we don't uh, here. Um, so the person listening to the evidence isn't putting it in context of this power wheel to notice, wow, these aren't a crime, but look at all these things that are happening that led up to why I'm here right now. Well, okay. So there's this really- I know that's a big question, but you know. It's a, well, it's a fine line because in a report, an A plus law enforcement report, they don't draw conclusions, right? They're just saying, this is what evidence, this is the evidence I've collected, right? Somebody else is gonna draw conclusions from it, right? And they need that evidence to do that. But positioning law enforcement to start making, I believe that, that what is happening here is some male privilege. Um, that, that's, that's taking that role to a place that it, they would struggle to go. Right, as a as a as a as a rather than make the conclusion, but that shows what evidence can be collected. It can, and you can craft a question to do that, right? Um, yeah, but somebody else should make that conclusion. Yeah, good. Anybody else thoughts or comments? Scott, I would just add to what Matt was saying that law enforcement training would include a focus on this. So the exposure to this information would be there, but they wouldn't necessarily pull this out of the, the, the pad of paper and, and use it at the scene, but they are, they are exposed to this when they're, when they're trained. Yes, and most of the officers who are, like I say, the Duluth officers who are executing investigations, probably at this point, depends how many, how long it's been since they were new recruits, don't remember this. But their policy, their arrest policy, they're acting out of it, right? We're asking, we're having them ask questions that help us understand this, um, even if they don't remember being trained on it, right? Which is the power of changing policy, right? As opposed to trying to train somebody to think different, let's change the structure of their job and have them be required to act different right yeah all right next slide jeff uh next slide jeff we talked about that all right so let's listen to ellen talk about putting this wheel together um and the intention behind it at the time they did it. they at the time they did it all right in its simplest explanation is that we sat down with over 200 women who were being battered and said if we get these guys in this group for 15, 20, 25 weeks, what do you want us to do with them that would make your life better? And then women started talking about the what they were being subjected to. A lot of economic control, a lot of um, isolation. They started talking about the way that he uses the kids against them. They just started talking about the, the barrage of things that are happening to them. And what women said is that we want him to see that it's not just hitting us that's battering. It's, it's standing over us and pointing the finger and mm. calling us names and telling us what the kids can and can't do in this kind of pattern of ways of, of controlling her through coercion, intimidation, violence, but also through money, through, through status, all this. So we ended up talking with that all through with them and came up with that power and control will in which the women were saying he gets power and he gets control. Now they didn't say he desires it. They said he gets this by using all these tactics. And somewhere in that discussion with the women, this tactics word came out. So we designed this graphic. It's basically a thing that says you get power and you get control by using these coercive tactics. And so Basically, the women said to us, we want them to see that that's what they're doing. 
and we want them to give it up for something that would lead to a more loving relationship. Okay. All right. Um, any thoughts or questions before we move to the next thing on that wheel? So that's a tool that you can use in your CCR teams um, to talk about uh, basically how, what these men are doing and what the uh, impact is on victims when they use it. Uh, and, and a suggestion might be just a thought that if you're going to do that, rather than go over the whole wheel at once, um, you could pick out certain tactics to, to talk about at each meeting as you build uh, a foundation for understanding the problem. The other thing to know, too, is that this goes to a little bit to, I think, what um, uh, somebody had mentioned, I forget who it was, but that this wheel, victims have a hard time naming sometimes their experience um, because when this happens the man is using intimidation emotional abuse blaming her while he's using the kids as a tool to get back at her like they're happening uh, in, in conjunction so this is like a, a constellation of different um, forms of abuse that come at her at once um, and again that's something that we need to understand um, as as interveners, that this is how women experience this. They don't just show up and try to isolate, right? He's isolating her um, because he believes that he gets to dictate who she is um, and where she lives. And if she doesn't do it, he's going to take the kids from her, right? Um, so that's how that, go ahead, Vincent. Um, just a real quick question. How much of this is, I'll use the word iterative, and when we were in our group, we used the expression to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. So in this, is there a, a process to this where mm -hmm. threat and intimidation was normalized to the point that it doesn't work anymore? And then it escalates into um, physical assaults. Physical assaults don't work anymore. So you find something worse to figure out on how to maintain this level of power and control. So is this iterative? within the offender's process? Well, I'm going on what I've heard from Vic, women who've experienced the violence, right? That this never goes away. That threat, like that fear, we're gonna listen to a woman actually talk about that coming up here. But um, to, to your point, Vincent, he will use as much coercion as it takes to win that moment. And that changes from moment to moment, right? So women have said, um, it was one thing when he's trying to get me to do this because of for whatever reason. But when he started going after my kids, then I got in his face regardless of what. So now he's gonna have to ramp up how much force he uses to get her to submit because she's resisting his attempts at control, right? So um, so yeah, there isn't, there isn't a template that says when she does this, he's gonna do this except for the fact that he is going to win, right? Because that's one of the, one of the mindsets of uh, men who use coercive control, men who batter, is that they will always win. Like a guy said in group, I may be wrong on occasion, but I'll never be wrong to her, right? Like their identity as men is grounded in the notion that they're better than her, right? And so if I'm wrong to her, then somehow, like even the idea in men's group where they have to use her name, um, men will say, I'm not participating because I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna use her name because it gives her some sort of equality with him, right? She's all kinds of other things that he calls her. Look in police reports, the same thing, that the, the level of objectification that goes on in his mind of who she is. So. The, the, especially in child custody stuff, man, the notion like they will you, they will tell you to the, to they, till they lose breath, how much they love their kids. But then you start looking at the decisions they're making and say, okay, so when you chose to um, not nap your little children on a visit and load them up with sugar before you brought them to the visitation center and gave them back to mom, Talk to me about how much you love your kids in that moment, right? Because that's just to get her back for leaving me, right? Or not changing their diaper 
or when mom sends um, uh, uh, breast milk so that the baby can nurse and then the dad dumps it out and feeds the baby cow's milk. And then the baby goes back to mom that night screaming all night because of the, of the stomach pain, right? You will not tell me how to raise my kid, right? Even if it's in the best interest of my kid, you're not gonna dictate that, right? Because I'm gonna win because I'm the one who gets to decide, right? So, yeah, that what's, that's, that's the difference between somebody who's struggling in a relationship with their partner, where, I mean, those of you who've done couples work, you wanna get to the place where the relationship is more important than getting my way. That is not who we're dealing with here. <laughs> getting my way is of the utmost importance, more than the relationship. Yeah, good, all right. Next slide, Jeff. Uh, next slide, Jeff. Thank you. Um, all right. So we live in this 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 culture, which puts men um, in a position, right? Um, patriarchal culture, as it's as it's labeled here. Out of that notion or that idea comes these rigid ideas of gender, right? This is who men are. This is who women are. And anybody who steps outside of those rigid gender norms um, is, has a consequence, right? With that, there's also these rigid, rigid hierarchical family structures, right? That come out of that. Um, and so when you have that kind of a landscape, it creates all of this uh, space for abuse um, that occurs. And, um, and, and when you, so I, I can't tell you how many times people have said, um, I, th I think all men should go through this, right? What they're really saying, uh, the, the process of, of naming all of this, this behavior, it's not that all men are batterers. All men are committing these acts of course of control against their partner, but all men are influenced by the notion that somehow they are um, smarter that their voice needs to be heard more than somebody else's. And for us men, we have to confront that if we wanna change that because it's so pervasive, right? Um, that's the struggle. And then when we look around the world at all these different programs and communities that are, that are working on this, this is their struggle, right? That they're trying to address. It goes back to this thing. Um, so again, it gets us away from thinking that there are some couples that just are toxic, right? Well, no, that's, this is a global problem. This isn't a problem in Albuquerque, right? This is a problem that is global. Um, when I ask a, a religious leader from Kurdistan, I said, why in your country do men beat women? And he said, because they can, because there's no institution that a woman could go to in my country to ask for help. Um, they all run by men. There's no place to go and there's no consequence, right? Um, so that, that's that kind of environment that you start seeing when you start working with these programs around the world, different versions of this notion um, that, that we're struggling with. So it is, again, it's a deeper problem than just couples who don't get along, right? Um, which makes it hard to intervene in, which makes it difficult um, to overcome, right? All right, next slide, Jeff. So if, this, if these are the tactics of oppression, right, um, then these are aspects of it. Hierarchy. There's always this notion where the violence comes out of that somebody's better than somebody else, right? That because of the color of my skin, because of the gender that I have, because of my sexual orientation, that, that I'm better than someone else, that, that the laws, the norms should all be catered to who I am. Uh, objectification. If you read police reports, you just see cunt, whore, bitch. I mean, just every kind of word you can imagine referred to their partner, but you don't see her name. That's just rare, right? And I've read thousands of those reports. Um, social conditioning. Um, this is the struggle in the men's group, right? Um, socially constructed to the idea 
that when I'm in a relationship with a woman, this is what I get to do. This is what um, my position allows me. As one of the women said in the, in the audio, um, he's the head of house. He gets to decide. He knows better, right? Um, so he acts out of that place. And then violence with impunity, right? He gets to act without consequence. Um, and so when he gets arrested for a domestic assault or somebody holds him accountable for his domestic assault against his family in any way, shape or form, it feels like his rights are being violated because it's his right. This is what he gets to do. It's my wife, it's my kids. This is what I get to do in my house, right? Um, and you don't have a say in it. Next slide, Ken. To Alexandria's point about the intersectionality of this work, right? Audre Lorde, her quote at the bottom, um, we don't have single issue lives. Um, so we have to have a, 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 a diverse way of thinking about who the women are that are experiencing this violence. Um, when we, and especially when we're coming up with solutions. So if we're gonna come up with a government policy that directs people to act in a certain way, we can't be just talking to the dominant culture, right? Because it's gonna land different, likely, on other cultures in that community. So for example, in Duluth, one of the things that, that prosecutors wanted was the officers to verify that when they're speaking with a woman um, who is a victim, that they find out whether she was using that night, okay? So that it took away the, the defense argument that she was intoxicated and somehow that goes to the credibility of her statements, okay? We build it into their arrest policy uh, and they interview victims and they are talking about this. And uh, with white women in Duluth, uh, for the most part, that question was not challenged. When they, when they interviewed indigenous women and asked them if they'd been drinking, the women's response in focus groups and at the scene was, okay, fine. You don't wanna hear from me? You don't believe me? Go away, right? You're not helpful. Because that question landed very different from a white officer to an indigenous woman in Duluth than it did if a white officer was asking that of a white woman. So we had to change the way that that question was asked. And we had to place that question at the end of the interview with an explanation as to why it is that the officer was asking that question. So that everybody who was asked it understood, this is a question I have to ask everybody I talk to, right? It's required by the prosecution. Have you had anything to drink tonight that would impair your testimony to me and everything you said? No, good, taken off the table. It's done, right? Um, but when they just asked it or they ask it up front of an interview, it didn't go so well, right? Those are the unintended consequences of things that we organize. That has to be one of the lenses. You're gonna implement something, do your due diligence to make sure that you're not gonna have any unintended consequences before you implement it. But then after you implement it, that's oftentimes where you're gonna find that this didn't land right. Um, uh, with this particular community of women um, who were being who were interviewed, right? Um, next slide, Jeff. So why focus on women? Because eighty-five percent of the cases that come to us are um, cisgendered, heterosexual males uh, uh, using course of control against cisgendered, heterosexual females. That is the bulk of the cases that we get. But as we've talked about. Domestic violence happens in most communities. So if you go to the next slide, Jeff. This is a power and control wheel adaptation from Thorn Harbor Health, which is a gay men's center in Melbourne, Australia. They spent two years talking to victims of domestic assault uh, in same-sex relationships. And again, the tactics on the wheel are typically stay the same because those are the tactics of oppression. That's how you oppress people, but what they did with the wheel is they added heterosexism on the outside, which was culturally part of what was allowing him to execute that violence in, a, in with impunity because the victims didn't report because they didn't want to get outed by reporting, right? So that was part of the, part of the 
uh, a ring added to this this lens of oppression that these these men were experiencing. Um, next slide, Jeff. So if you look at the under just taking one of the tactics using male privilege, many of them are the same as what's on this wheel. So the men uh, in these relationships talked about making all the big decisions, treat you like a servant, being the one who defines each other's partner's role and duties in the relationship. Same as on our wheel, right? What's different is using passing as a straight or cisgender to discredit you or put you in danger, right? That was specific to that community. Um, he uses his status in the LB LGBTI community to diminish yours. Um, providing misleading information about non-monogamy or polymorphous uh, Morris relationships that benefit him, right? Um, these were specific to that community under male privilege. And this is what the men who were experiencing the violence um, said, these are, this is, these are the things that he does. So when Thorn Harbor intervenes with the offender in a rehabilitation class, now they know what to be talking to him about because they know what he's doing. That's what these wheels help us do is, is frame a rehabilitation program. Now I know what conversations we need to have because I know the tactics that he's using, right? And then the next slide, Jeff. This is their equality wheel um, that they came up, which is again, quite different than ours. Um, in the center, they have equity and accountability because that was extremely important to the men who were victims in this particular community. And if you go to the next slide, Jeff, and these are on our website and you can download these for free if you would like. Um, most of these are things that uh, all victims would want um, from their partner. But the one that was different um, from, from ours is he respects my privacy when talking to professionals, police and other courts about his violence, right? In case the victim does not wanna be outed in that process, um, which was different than, than what would be something that women in heterosexual relationships might talk about. So again, going all the way back to Alexandria's point at the beginning, there isn't one way to understand this problem. Um, there's typically a way to understand the tactics of abuse, but how those tactics play out and how they get leveraged from one community and culture to the next it differs, right? Um, and, and you have to understand what that is and every one of your communities. That's why talking to women who experience this violence is, or all victims who experience this violence in your community is so critical. Because if you don't understand how the men are getting away with it in their homes, using it and justifying it, how are you gonna design something for them um, to change from? So that's, that's, so as David said at the beginning, the Duluth model is more about the, than the power and control wheel. Um, the Duluth model is what created the power and control wheel. It's what created our CPS um, uh, uh, specialized unit for domestic violence. It's, it's what created our um, police policy. It's what created our visitation center. It's what created our curriculum for uh, working with offenders, right? It's the, it's the way we organize and it's how we know what we know. We go to the people we serve, we ask them what their experience is and we build that into the solution that we're trying to come up with. Does it take longer? Yes, it does, right? But it sticks because now you have the confidence to know that you're acting and, and, that, and that women who are experiencing this violence um, have a hand in what you're changing in their lives, right? You're just not doing it as a, as a star chamber of experts who, who, who know, right? All right, next slide, Jeff. All right, before we move to course of control specifically, um, any questions, any comments, any thoughts where we're at so far? Again, this last conversation was really, because you know, I could say, this is how you train this with your group, but I don't know your group, right? I don't know, um, what's gonna, how they're gonna hear this, right? So you're gonna have to take what we talked about and find a, a lens that the folks in, in, in your teams can hear it, right? 
Um, but the but the overriding piece here, this is not a relationship problem. This is not because people live in toxic relationships. This problem is much deeper and more pervasive than that. And what we're intervening in here is something that women across the globe are experiencing, right? It isn't just in our community. And so this is an epidemic of violence against women that we're, that we're struggling with. So it takes a bigger response. It weighs the weight of it, of what we're doing is much greater than just if it was thought of as two people who are, had a bad day, right? And there are people that just have a bad day, right? That also happens. So you want, going back to Matt's question about context, you want all that context to be able to give some, give you some confidence that, okay, I think this, this situation that happened was a bad day. This isn't an ongoing threat. This isn't an ongoing problem. It was a crime, but it isn't that, excuse me, it isn't this, right? So an example in Duluth, guy has an alcohol problem. He runs out of alcohol one night. So, and usually, and his wife said, typically he just drinks till he passes out and we're good but he didn't have enough to get there. So he's gonna to go to his car and he's gonna go get some alcohol and she's not gonna let him. So now they're in a battle over the keys at the car in the driveway and the neighbors hears the commotion, looks out the window as the guy comes back with his elbow because she was reaching over his shoulder to get the keys and hits her in the face with his elbow. Down she goes, okay? That's a crime. That's domestic assault under our statute. Right, he, get a, he gets arrested for domestic assault. But because of the police report, because of the, work, uh, the questions we ask of the victim, and then follow up with the victim, um, we were able to see that this isn't, this isn't a relationship where the violence is coming out of this notion that I get to decide for you how your life should be. This is an alcohol problem, and that's where the violence came out of. So the solution then is gonna be alcohol. Now that guy, was in our men's group, and this is the difference. Most, if you do that, if you do that work, and I think there's a lot of people on here that do, you know that most of the guys in your group don't wanna be there. They don't think they belong there, that whole bit. This guy couldn't wait to come to group. He said, I love this group. This is helping me be a better man. <laughs> okay, well, that just helped us, you know, understand, well, you're not that guy. That's why you're coming, you're presenting the way you are, right? Um, yeah. Okay, so this is the thing to consider. How do you take what we've been, we've been talking about and help your team create a lens for them to look at this problem through? Right. All right. All right, coercive control. Um, this is something that's been talked about in, uh, uh, in the Better Women's Movement for decades. Um, in fact, I think the first time it was put in print was in, in the mid 1980s um, as, a, as a way to understand what, the, what women are experiencing the most abuse from. That to somebody else's point on the call here, um, it's not the physical violence that they're experiencing the most abuse from, it's coercive control. That's what they're, that's what the bulk, and that's what actually Evan Stark's work in his book points out that the, most of the violence that women experience in these relationships comes out of this notion of coercion um, with, uh, with a goal of control. Next slide, Jeff. So if you look at the power and control wheel, although coercive control underlies everything on the wheel, typically it's being acted out of these um, shaded areas on the wheel. Next slide, Jeff. So when you break down when you sit down with women and say, all right, so talk about how he gets his way without using violence. And they start giving you examples. And then you ask them, okay, well, how did he establish that? Like, how did he get to the point where all he had to do was say this and you'd do that, right? I think going back to Carla's, a thing that Carla brought up earlier. Um, well, the first thing he does is becomes a threat to her physical, emotional, or spiritual well being. Somehow he's a threat to it, right? Um, he's punched a hole in the wall. He's strangled the cat in front of her. He's beat up people on the street, right? Somehow he's established for her that if you push me too far, this is, how, this is what I'm willing to do, right? 
Then he identifies and uses her needs and attachments as leverage. So if she's a mother, her relationship with her kids is absolutely going to be used um, as a tactic. If she's got a career, extended family, friends, he becomes a threat to all of those different attachments if they're useful to him to get her to submit to what he wants. Then he restricts, depletes, destroys access um, to those attachments um, to wear her resistance down to what he's demanding of her, right? So we did a, we have a wheel called a post-separation wheel. And these were all the tactics that women talked about him using after she's left, after she's gotten away from him, right? as opposed to the tactics on this particular wheel. And one of the things that, I don't know if it should or shouldn't have been, but it was, um, that took our breath away is how many women that we were talking to had experienced sexual assault in the parking lots of McDonald's um, exchanging kids in an unsupervised setting. So if we go back to the list, he establishes himself as a threat. So he's been beating her. So she knows that he's capable of going to that direction. Um, he identifies her needs and attachments. In this instance, it's her kids. He restricts, depletes, or destroys. So now he keeps the kids for two months and she doesn't get to see them. Now she's gone to court and she said he doesn't comply with the order. And what does the judge say? Well, if that's the case, call law enforcement. So she calls law enforcement. Law enforcement shows up and says, you know what? This is a civil matter go back to court. So it's been, it's been made clear to her by the community that you're on your own, right? And now she hasn't seen her kids for two months. And then women are saying, now I'm doing things that I would never normally do because I need to see my children. And he's got them. So he doesn't have to threaten to beat her. He doesn't have to threaten any physical violence. All he has to do is say, you wanna see your kids? you're going to give me a blow job or I get back in my car and I drive away. Right. And there's no community that she can access response to say, you know, you don't get to do that because actually the community has given a stamp of approval. No, you do get to do that as it turns out because there's no consequence for it. Violence with impunity. Right. And it won't stop. Um, and then inter intermittent episodes of overt violence to reinforce the pattern of coercive control, right? This is basically the core of how this um, gets created um, with, with a victim who's experiencing this. Now, um, next slide, Jeff. Um, there's this really interesting characteristic that, that comes out of this. So I'm gonna pull my uh, little board over here. So when we're working with men in group, we use this triangle to represent this hierarchical relationship that he creates with the, with the violence. And he's at the top of this because he can enforce what he wants um, and, and he can enforce being there. She's at the bottom down here, experiencing all of what comes downhill towards her. Now, this thing about being a victim, it's, it's a characteristic of people at the top of a hierarchy or a person at the top of a hierarchy to feel like a victim. And typically the feeling of being a victim comes out of his notion of entitlement. So if I or we at the top of this hierarchy don't get what we think we deserve, we are being victimized. And the interesting thing about the offender is, is as long as he hangs on to this notion that he's a victim, he can't change because the problem is outside of himself. It's with other people, right? So as long as his vision is that it's her, it's the police, it's the church, it's the pastor, it's child protection, it's everybody doesn't understand the problem, but I do, he's stuck, right? Now, what's interesting is that he, that this feeling like a victim of not getting what I think I deserve is the same. He thinks it's the same as what we understand she's experiencing, right? 
at the bottom, the violence, the impact of the power and control, all the things that we talked about, he thinks that's where he's at. He thinks that because he's been held accountable, that's where she's at, right? That's what rehabilitation is challenging, these notions that he has. But it also makes, it also gives him justification in his relationship to punish her because he feels like a victim of her behavior because he's not getting what he thinks he deserves, which makes it more dangerous for her. So that's something, again, that we need to have insight into as we're understanding the problem and understanding him is that as long as he feels like a victim, it makes him more dangerous to her, right? So um, next slide, Jeff. What we're gonna do is listen, is, is, is watch a video of uh, Eric. And um, Eric is a guy who uh, I've known for almost the whole time I worked here. Um, this was his last referral to the agency and he did some of his best work. Um, and he wanted, he came to me and said, is there something I can do to help others? And we said, hey, we'd love, I'd love to interview you and use it as a training tool so that people can get some insight. And he agreed to do that. Um, and so this is, the, this is the video. So what you're gonna hear me do is basically, if you work with our curriculum for men, you know about control logs. So basically that's the log in my head. What did you do? Why'd you do it? What are the beliefs that support it? And then what were the effects? So that's sort of the interview. But pay attention to how did Eric, Eric's feeling like he was a victim get shaped by his thinking? What are the beliefs that he has that actually make him, that actually make him feel like he's the victim, right, of her behavior? Okay, that's the that's what I'm asking you to pay attention to as you listen to uh, this conversation. Okay, and then we'll come back and discuss what you uh, what you come up with. All right, all right. See you in a minute. Did you have one? Did you develop a look? Yeah. When you became an adult. Yeah. I, How'd you use it? Um, I would, when I started feeling myself getting hot or getting angry, I, I would just get an extremely stern face, you know, and just ultimately just look and say like, look, this is it. You're, you're, you're crossing the line with me. Don't fuck with me anymore. You know, like go ahead, push my buttons. This is it right now. You know? And then I would, I get that look on my face and I'd go dead silent. That look really spoke, you know, volumes as to what I was thinking and feeling. What did you want from them when you gave them the look? I wanted them to do what I wanted, to, you know, stop doing something they were doing and to do what I wanted them to do. Okay, so how did she know that that look meant business? Because she, she seen me use it on the streets with other men. She seen that when I was getting into it with other men and, you know, I got that look and I got silent, you know, or I'd, I'd make a quick direct threat. And then I got silent. If I kept that look, she knew what was coming because after I, you know, after I got silent, generally like I'd get violent with that other person. Did you use the same body language you used on the street with her then? Yeah, eventually that's kind of how the abuse would start. I, I, I'd get angry at her and then I'd give her that look. And then one time I just, I ended up snapping and I ended up assaulting her. And ever since that moment, she knew, you know, that I was capable of doing it with her. How did you, were there other statements or how did you use language um, in a way that was th coercive or threatening to your partner? And yeah, don't fuck with me. Like, don't even fucking test me right now. I'm not in the fucking mood. Like you were pushing buttons you don't want to push. Like I'm this fucking close, you know, like I dare you go ahead. You know what's up. What does she know about you other than the violence on the street, right? Um, I mean, are you have you demonstrated to her that you're willing to go that far? Once I've said that, you know, those things once to her and use violence that one time on her, she already knew at that point. What's, a, what's an example? What was going on where you just used your language to threaten and coerce her into doing what you wanted her to do? 
okay, um, an example, my partner wasn't letting me see my son or our son. And, was uh, she your partner or was she ex-partner? Well, ex-partner at the time. Okay. She wasn't, she wasn't letting me see our son. Um, but we were still sleeping together. We were still hooking up, you know? And, uh, so my, you know, like I, I wanted to see him and I wanted to see her and she, you know, wouldn't let me see him. So I, I, I got really fed up and sick of it and it just built up inside me. And, and finally we're on the phone one day and I told her like, look, if you don't let me see my son, if you don't follow through with bringing him to see me, I'm going to beat your boyfriend's ass every single day until you follow through and let me see my son. And then, you know, I, I told her like, that's it. Like, there's no more negotiation. Like, I'm not talking about this no more. I'm not playing your games. That is it. What'd you do? I beat his ass in front of her. Um, I beat him up and I told her like, look, you could have fucking prevented this. Like, this is on you. What are some of the examples of the beliefs that you had that backed up some of this behavior that you were talking about? I have the right to see my son. I, you know, I have the right to, you know, basically I have the right to the time with her, you know, like in my mind, like we're still seeing each other, even though she's with another man, like, like you're, you know, like I had the right to that. Um, we were together long before you met him. So why didn't that come into your thinking? Why was it only about the fact that you wanted her time, you wanted your son's time, right? Why wasn't she included in that equation? Why wasn't her? I mean, she's, a, she's dating somebody else, right? Because I felt like a victim. Like, I honestly felt like the victim at the time. I felt like she's done so much to me, and it was my turn to do it back to her, and that, you know, she owed me. I felt like she owed me. Tell me more about this, this, this being a victim. Did it blind you from what you were doing? Yeah, completely. Like it, it, when I felt like the victim, I literally only could think about what I wanted, what I needed. I didn't think about my son, what he wanted, what he needed. I didn't think about what was going on in her life. You know, the fact that she was struggling. Like all I thought about was what I wanted and, and like what I felt like I deserved. What effect did you have on her and her son by your behavior? she was afraid of me she 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 felt like she constantly had to walk on eggshells she felt let down by me because she knew that underneath like all this like I was a decent man and that I was capable of more she you know she seen that side of me what would your I mean you've been through a lot of program since you were younger yeah I mean people trying to throw things at you and seeing what sticks and What's something that you would say that facilitators in your experience have done in different programs you've been in that, that has been, you know, uh, that has just got in the way of your ability to change? And what could, advice could you give facilitators to say, this is the way you need to, to facilitate a, a process so that I have the opportunity to find myself and, uh, and change? The more they try to paint a picture of something, of what they, what their view of reality is, that's gonna throw up, you know, mental blocks with everyone. It has with me in the past. Why? Because, you know, it's hard for people to relate to other people when it comes to stuff like that a lot of the times, especially, you know, especially when it's something that a guy doesn't want to admit to himself or in front of others, you know, like they're gonna go on the defensive immediately and the best thing ultimately is to ask questions of that person and get them to admit their their view of reality what how they see it okay you know and and the more they do that the more questions they ask the more that person opens up you know people like to talk about themselves you know mm -hmm. so when they're putting their view out there they're doing it on their own because they want to okay all right so what we're going to do is we're going to break into your small group so you can have this conversation in your small group. Um, what did you see him do? Uh, what was intent? What were the, importantly, what was the thinking that was behind his behavior and is the thinking that was justifying him being a victim of, of her, right? Now, something you should know before you go into the conversation, this is a longer edited conversation that we, that we had, 
is that um, one of the reasons why she didn't want him to see their son is because she didn't want to have to sleep with him. And she was in another relationship and he wanted to have sex with her. And so I don't want to come over, but he'd use like, I want to see my son as the reason to get her there. Right. The other reason he didn't want her to see uh, him to see their son is because he was high and he was using and he was dealing and she didn't want her son around that, which doesn't get mentioned. Right. Um, but that's all part of this, um, this piece. So, all right. So in your groups, uh, basically what you got, you had down in, on paper um, from this conversation, um, talk about what you noticed and we'll come back and we'll process it um, as a large group. Any questions about what you're going to do in your small group? Okay. Invitations should be on the way. Okay. We are all back. All right. So who would like to uh, kick off the conversation that their group had? How about group one? I feel bad for you because you only have four people in it. <laughs> you have lots of time to talk. We, we brought up a, a couple of things. We had a question about the facilitators in our group on some of the tactics that were being used. And uh, I mentioned what, what I had experienced in one of our groups where the individual, uh, much like what relationship and dialogue you had between Eric and, and, and the, in the video, we had a guy who was in prison for many years and cowed out. And he came out and he started sharing the tactics that he was using for his power and control and what he was trying to show her through his male role belief system. You know, he was able to go ahead and influence her decisions and what she was doing because he thought it was his right. He thought, you know, m many years, not only uh, from his family, but, you know, his culture, you know, he, he believed that he could he could exercise what he was doing and some of the creative tactics that they get, you know, uh, Albert brought up the, the fact what could happen or what would happen if, if the guy, the boyfriend was stronger than him. And if he tried anything with the boyfriend, the boyfriend would kick his ass. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, we had a, we had the, the same thing kind of happen where the guy would revert to slashing windows. I mean, slashing tires and breaking windows, you know, he, mm -hmm. you know, look, I can still control you. We even had another person, Put a tracking device for under hundred bucks. He advanced his tactics where he could tell her, "I know exactly where you are, twenty four seven. He didn't tell her how he did it. He divulged to us how he did it, but he had put a tracking device and on his cell phone, he knew what she was doing. So, yeah. when, when they start using the tactics of extortion to get what they want, and extortion by definition is compelling somebody to do something unlawful by threat or or or, or harm, uh, that's what they're doing." And, you know, they get, and, and we see it. And that's one of the common things I think shared amongst all the people we have in our offender group is that at one point they've used this male role belief system to go ahead and exert their power and control over the victim. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Other, other groups. Uh, um, that was in group two. Um, we, we thought that, well, that he, uh, he had a history of violence and she knew he had a history of violence and all he had to do was give the, the look and, uh, um, he had a belief that he had the right to see his kid, which, which was probably not real, the real reason. He also had a, a right to have sex with her. We don't really even know how many other women he was having sex with that he had a right to. Uh, uh, and so he used intimidation and, and he, uh, he uh, um, um, beat up his his uh, his ex's boyfriend, uh, and then blamed her for. So his belief was that it's your fault, your fault that I had to beat him up. Yeah, and how many times again have I heard that in men's group where the guy said, "Look, she went to the bar by herself, right, without me," and so you don't do that. If you're in a relationship with somebody, you don't go to the bar. So when she came home and I grabbed her by the hair. And I pulled her across the room. It wasn't really me doing that. It was her doing that. She did this to herself, right? Like right. that's the minimized deny and blame piece, right? right. Because, because uh, 
if you would have complied, you, this wouldn't be happening to you. So it's your fault, right? right. Yeah. Others. What were the beliefs that supported his notion that he was a victim? His right to, to see the his right to see the child. Yeah. You're denying me my right. And this is the thing, right? This is what gets compelling inside your CCR, because there's a belief in every community, virtually that I've been to at least, that a father should have a right to see his children, right? And so he's using that phrasing. I have a right to see my child, right? Um, but that's obviously not all what's involved, but that's compelling, right? So then how does your response gonna take that up, right? How are you gonna understand what it's like when, when the women are the victims in your community who are experiencing this violence? How do they then talk about that space when an abusive uh, father is demanding time with the kids? What's it actually about, right? Is it about getting access to her? Is it about actually spending time with the kids, right? Um, is it about punishing her, right, for leaving? There's all kinds of stuff that uh, women are, are navigating um, that's behind that phrase. A father has a right to see their children. And how do we how do we account for those those other things so that he can see his children in a safe way? Right. So some of the beliefs that I was jotting down: I have a right to see my son. I have a right to her, the time with her. And he justified it by saying I was with her before before him. So therefore, I got a right to you. Um, she owed me. I mean, go back to what we were talking about here. Being a victim at the top of a hierarchy is not getting what you think you deserve. That's what, how it gets defined up there. It's defined quite differently down here to her, right? But that's how he ends up defining it. Again, good for us to know because it has implications to his level of threat. Um, and uh, it's a way to identify who he is. Is this a, is this a one-time event or is this a guy who, who has a mindset that's going to be a threat to her ongoing? And then he said the victimization blinded him from what he was doing. Again, it raises his threat. If he's not seeing the impact on his children and on the victim by what he's doing, because all he can think about is what he thinks he deserves, that increases his threat to the family. All right. Any other thoughts? I know we're getting close to lunch. Conversation tends to dwindle. <laughs> Nobody wants to be the one to keep it going, right? All right. Am I? Uh, uh, no, I got it, one. It, okay, go ahead, Olivia. Yes. Hi. My name is Olivia Begay, and I'm attending from the Navajo Nation in Northern Arizona. Um, I've, I've been an advocate since 2013, but mainly in the shelter setting. Um, just recently, I transferred over to being an advocate for the prosecutor's office. And a couple weeks ago, we had a case where the perpetrator was using um, the court system and law enforcement as his power and control because here on the Navajo Nation, our, our laws are different from maybe all of you guys, where you guys are coming from. Um, they only get one year when they're convicted for domestic violence, maybe even six months. So how he was controlling that was, oh, the court is going to only give me this many days. I'll be out and you ain't going nowhere. I'm going to have somebody watch you while I'm incarcerated. 
you're depending on the court, but they're not going to do anything for you. So I'll be back. It's just like 48 hours. I'll be back and you can't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Law enforcement don't believe you no more. You're just crying wolf. So he had that control over a victim like that. And she just really gave up. She's like, nobody's here to help me. And again, he was putting himself as a victim saying, she's doing this to me. She did this to me. You guys are the ones taking away my children. It's all your fault. You took my children. So I've never seen that. And I've never heard that when I was in the shelter setting, but when I moved over to being an advocate for the prosecutors, it was a lot different because I started to understand why these victims were giving up on following through with their charges and wanting to get away and looking for help. And it was always the process is too long. It's too lengthy, forget it. I don't want, he's just gonna keep coming. And sure enough, when I started with these guys, I heard the other side, the perpetrator side. They're like, yeah, I can do this. Oh, you guys won't do anything. You guys will leave me alone. It's only a year. With, I'll be out in no time. So he had that control over her, letting her know that he, she belonged to him and she had no way out because there was nobody there to help her. And she just gave up and it was it was just ugly try to fight both sides so it's actually complicating when it comes to that when the perpetrator actually starts saying no I'm the victim because of this this is how I'm a victim but he neglects the abusive part of it and says no I'm I'm physically abusing her because of this but then he doesn't under really understand the other types of abuse he's conflicting on her. Well, he doesn't see it because it is to his in his mind it isn't abuse. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So then, so if that's the circuit. So, so when you hear something like that from Olivia, who's an advocate in a community, right? That that it's that it's that it's effective for an offender to tell. The person that they're harming, that the system won't do anything and I'm going to get away with it. Well, if that was, if her experience with the system was, was counter to that, she could tell that he's lying. But if that's what it feels like to her, and then he says it, it has double the force. This is why we coordinate responses, right? So when we worked in the, with the Minnesota prison system, one of the interventions that we created for men leaving the prison system and getting back out onto parole who were saying the exact kind of stuff that Olivia is talking about. We created a wraparound opportunity that, um, that these women could, could, could uh, uh, request. And that means that before he's released, DOC set up a meeting and called in law, local law enforcement, teachers, uh, medical people, like whoever in her life that she thought was her circle of resources in the community. And they got together at a table and said, this is how dangerous he is. This is the fear that she has of him. This is why we are all here because this is how dangerous we think this person can be. And when or if, if or when he steps out and commits a crime and violates contact with her, this is what we're going to, this is what our plan is, right? And what women have said about that process is that if none of it would have happened, they'd have called up and said, hey, I just saw him drive by and it's scaring me. And local law enforcement says, well, driving by your house is probably not a, not a crime. So we're not gonna deal with it. But it is, a, it is a violation of his parole, right? So now everybody knows. And she said, when I made the call, within two days of him getting out, he was in my town. And I made the call and everybody responded and dealt with them, right? That's taking the struggle that a woman who's being harmed is telling you is, is, is what's going on, what the, what the problem is, and designing a solution around it that brings the community in so that we're not, we're not basically saying you're on your own, figure it out, right? No, like our police chief here, when the pandemic hit, 
we put out a video out to, to, to the community on the website that said in the chief saying, if you call, if you choose to call 911 for help, know that you're not just calling law enforcement, you're calling a community who is ready and willing to respond, right? Because that's who we are. Um, if you choose to enter into that. So that's what you want. And then what the flip side of that is when guys, now I'm not telling you that we're perfect by any stretch. So I will retire and the job will continue, trust me. But we have guys coming into men's group who instead of saying, this is what I'm gonna do, um, the, you know, I can get away with. You got guys in men's group saying, hey, you know what? I've, uh, it's, it's taken me about three months to get to this group and uh, um, because I uh, assaulted my partner. And uh, I said to him, well, why is it taking you three months to get here? Because he said, I've been in an in-house treatment program for my, for my alcohol use. And uh, I had to go through that before I could re-enter into, into this. And, uh, and one of the guys sitting next to him says, dude, do not use, they will find you. <laughs> right? That's what we want the conversations between offenders to be. They, you step out here and they're going to go after you, right? Um, so toe the line, right? Or you know they're talking. Like I go to a small town. I said, what's the bar that they hang out in? And they tell you how to get through the system. They can all tell you what bar it is, right? Um, they're, they're having a conversation. What conversation are they having, right? We have some impact on that by how we design ways of responding in our communities. Okay, all right. We're five minutes past lunch. We'll put up an hour, um, that's for, for lunch. Um, we'll put up a timer so you know when to come back. And uh, I hope you all have a great lunch. I know that your buffet is all laid out, um, hot food, um, <laughs> all that. So uh, uh, we'll see you in an hour. Okay, welcome. Hope your lunch was great. Nourished, energized, ready for the afternoon, right? <laughs> it's warmed up here, it's about zero. <laughs> <laughs> okay so um any thoughts comments questions that you have before we continue with the material scott if you don't mind my name is david from denton texas uh joining you here this morning. I've been Thank to Denton, you. Texas. You have, yeah. Uh, I I have. You, I've had an opportunity to visit with you a couple of times over Fort Worth. Some of your, some of the work that okay. you, uh, you've you done and your team have done over in Fort Worth with Gill and uh, uh, the folks oh, yeah. in Tarrant County. So I uh, wanted just to expand a little bit about some of the, uh, I've been listening to the, the uh, some of the work that uh, needs to be done out, especially with the law enforcement community um, addressing um, I recently had an opportunity to uh, listen to Bancroft talk about um, usually when you when you when you get those communities where there's a lot of arrest of women uh, in in communities that you can kind of at least he implied that if you look at the numbers you can narrow it down to if you look at who's doing the arrest you can narrow it down to a couple of law enforcement you know individuals and sometimes it may be a systemic issue uh, in many cases it, it may be a systemic issue but it also may be uh, and so I'm wondering as, as we're, you know, talking or thinking about continuing law enforcement training, the use of power and control wheels and how that could potentially influence or at least uh, educate uh, uh, individual uh, uh, law enforcement uh, uh, police officers uh, on how they see, you know, the, the, what they describe as the crime scene uh, at the moment they get there and whether or not that, you know, if you'd like to share your thoughts about that. Yeah, thanks, David. Great question. So, any time that, that we do training for system practitioners, like in a government system, for example, if we're training them to understand the difference between uh, oppressive violence versus resistive violence, for example, um, the next thing we gotta do is say, okay, so if that's the case, then this is what you do. But what we typically do is we train them on the, the dynamic, whatever that is that we're trying to convey, 
and then we just hope they do the right thing, right? But it isn't about whether they believe it, don't believe it. Let me put it this way. Here's an example, right? And I'm going to use a sports analogy. Um, so let's say that you've got a, uh, a soccer team, right? And that soccer team has a soccer field. They have a round ball. They got a net on either side of the field, right? The field is so wide. The field is so long. They love soccer. They play soccer. Now you tell all those soccer players, I'm going to take you over to this baseball diamond. I'm going to show you a new game. It has a new field. It has bases. It has a bat, a different size ball. And these are the rules. You teach them all of that and you show them how to play the game. They love the game. They love playing baseball. But then you say, now you got to go back. You got to go back home. They go back to the soccer field. What are they going to do? They're going to play soccer because that's the ball. That's the field, right? You haven't changed their tools. You got to change the tools, right? So they can love what you're they're listening to. But if you don't give them a tool to execute what they know, they're going to continue to do what they do, right? So um, when we do training here, we're always doing it after we've changed something in the system, right? And we're going to cover that in detail, uh, especially tomorrow. But um, as an example, we developed, so guess who, Duluth was the first place to come up with a, with this notion of a mandatory arrest uh, policy, right, that police agreed to. Guess who the first person arrested under our mandatory arrest policy was? <laughs> a woman who was fighting back, right? Um, that was not the intent behind the policy. So um, we had to go back and we sat down with advocates, command at the sheriff's department and the police department. And we read 50 reports where women were arrested for domestic assault. And then we asked the question, did we achieve protect and serve? That's one of the questions. Did we achieve protect and serve? when we made these arrests. And law enforcement, I mean, everybody in the room could see that's not what happened here. That's not what we did, right? So with, in partnership with them, we developed what became known here as the self-defense predominant aggressor arrest policy, which means that if an officer goes to the scene, right? Now th this is where they can take their training and apply it. If the officer goes to the scene, and there are probable cause injuries on both parties. Now they have direction. The policy says you have multiple offenders, so you'll follow the multiple offender policy in, the, in our domestic policy. And then the protocol gives them the tools on how to do that. So here's how you assess for self-defense. Was either party acting in self-defense? If no, if yes, then there's no crime. Arrest single, finger, single offender. If there's probable cause injuries on both parties and both and neither one was acting in self-defense, then who was the predominant aggressor? And here's the scale to figure that out. Now, the person who's the predominant aggressor gets taken into custody. The other person, that report goes to the prosecutors and the prosecutors make the decision if they want to uh, impose charges or not on the other person, okay? Officers do that. They do that routinely. Why do they do it routinely? Because it's their policy, right? Not because we trained them. So anytime we train practitioners, we have to link a tool that they can use to implement what they've just learned. Otherwise they'll go back to doing what they're doing no matter what they've heard, right? Um, and you're always gonna get high performers that can act out of that, but you're not gonna get a department to do that, right? And this is the power of policy, right? So, um, we had a, when we used to do CCR trainings here in Duluth, when you could actually come to Duluth and have in-person trainings, um, we had a woman from, uh, I think she was from England or another country, I think it was. And she went on one of our ride-alongs with law enforcement um, in the evening after the training. And they roll up to uh, a couple that was reported uh, to 911 that there's a couple arguing on the street and uh, it was heated. Officer comes up, de-escalates it, interviews both parties, no crime has occurred. Um, he goes that way, she goes that way, and it's done, right? So uh, the woman in our training said to the officer, you know, you must really have to care about people to do such a wonderful job de-escalating that. 
And, and, I, and she said, you know what he said? And I, you know, I'm a little nervous because I have no, no idea what he's going to say. But he said, ma'am, I got to tell you, I really don't care. <laughs> what I'm doing is what my policy tells me to do. And if I do it the right way, then I save myself hours of work. Because if I don't do a good job, somebody's going to get thrown through a window down the street. Now I'm going to have to take somebody into custody. I'm going to do arrests, interviews. Like my, my whole evening is taken up, right? So I'm doing my job, right? Don't try to change the mindset. Change what drives the, the, the behavior, right? Yeah. And that will eventually, interestingly, change a lot of mindsets because they're going to be asking questions they never thought of before. And they're going to be hearing answers that never occurred to them. So, yeah, we had one, one community... Uh, the officers are a smaller community, about 7,000. And the officer said, the best domestic violence training I've ever had is asking the, these risk questions to victims because I'm hearing things that I never heard before when I've been at the scene. Yep. Does that help, David? Okay, got the thumbs up. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Questions, comments, thoughts? Okay, we will continue. So we just listened to Eric talk about executing coercive control on his, on his family. That's one thing that we have to be able to uh, highlight and bring to light for our system. Olivia did a great job of talking about how when you work in the shelter, you don't see that mindset. You don't understand that perspective. That's the same with everybody in the system, depending on who they primarily work with, right? So we need to know both to be able to develop responses um, that deal with his accountability and her safety. So now let's listen to a woman named Cami on audio uh, talk about what it was like to live with somebody who exercised coercive control. Now, her partner was actually a law enforcement officer um, in a very small community. And um, in the community she was in, uh, the advocates wouldn't even work with her because they were so afraid of him. That's the kind of power he had in that small community, right? So she had to travel 30 some miles to us to get help um, and advocacy uh, for herself. So that's how we came to know her. Um, but she also agreed uh, to give an interview about what it's like to live in that space. So now what I want you to pay attention to, if Jeff, you could bring up the slide. Um, same thing, what did he do? What were his intents? What were the beliefs that he uh, exposed when he was telling you why he was being abusive? What were the effects on you? And then how was Cammy impacted because he felt like a victim, right? So again, you see the threat that he poses because he feels like a victim, right? Um, and then also contrast how Cami talks about coercive control versus how Eric did, right? Um, for uh, Eric, oops, sorry. For Eric, it was it was basically there were these moments of abuse, and what you're going to hear from Cami is that it was a life, right? It just isn't. I don't. Like there is a respite from the threat that he posed, right? So something to pay attention to. All right, so we'll listen to this and we'll come back. Thank you for coming in and being part of this webinar and sharing your experience with us. Uh, as you know, the, this curriculum that we use is framed on women's experience and and one of the things we talk about in training is how important it is to understand the experience of those we're trying to serve, um, which, is, which are those subject to the tactics on this wheel. So, um, so thank you for being here. You're welcome. Um, I guess where I'd like to start is if you could give us some idea of what it's like to be in the space with somebody who is uh, using coercion and threats. Well, it's a, it's a constant hum. It's 
there. It's in the air. It's in the space that you're living in with him. What do you sense? That you need to be aware. You need to be aware of his next move. Is it always something that you are keyed into? Absolutely. Okay. And, and so why? Well, like I said, it's a, it's a constant hum. You could be having a really good day. And then all of a sudden it's like a light switch has been flipped and he is trying to control your every move. Um, so do you have an example of where he used his body to get you to pay attention to the nonverbal signals that he had that said, you need to start doing what I mm -hmm. say? Yeah, I was cooking at the stove and he, for some reason, decided that he was going to come up and he was going to be big and bullying and I knew something was coming. Um, the magnitude of the threat, I didn't know at that point in time because I just didn't know it was hard to judge. Um, but he came into my space and he was very big. It was like you know, body bullying and he stood on my foot and he started to demean my cooking, tell me how to do it, tell me I was doing it wrong. And so I had to adjust in that moment, even though I was, I was fearful. I was thinking that the pot could end up going on my foot and burning me. There was a lot of things going through my mind, including trying to be aware of what I needed to be aware of with him and how I needed to respond to him to be safe in that moment. Did he, was his foot on you at this point? The foot, his foot was on my foot. I can, if I think about it enough, I could feel it. It was on my left foot. Okay. And um, when did he take his foot off of yours? When he had decided, when he had decided that he had conveyed to me that he was right. What did he use to coerce you to do what he wanted you to do or to punish you for something you shouldn't have done? What were the things that he used as leverage? Well, the kids were absolutely one of the first things. It could have been also my career. It could have been something that people, most people take for granted, like food. It could have been him trying to force me to have sex with him in order to get you know my basic needs met what is this like if you could give us an example of what it sounds like what words would he use um to to, to leverage these things coerce you to get what get what he wanted he would literally tell me that if i didn't do what he wanted that he would take the kids or that i would never see them again was it an empty threat oh no he eventually accomplished it he took the kids away from me and I didn't see them for years. I missed out on their teenage years. When he was leveraging these things against you, did he ever make it your fault? That it was not his fault that this was happening. It was your fault that it was happening. It was oftentimes, look what you made me do. Uh, one example of that I can think of was when he had gotten on top of me and he was pounding my head into the floor. He had his hands in my hair and he was telling me that I had ruined his perfect little family and look what I had done and look at what I had made him do. Look what I had made him become. Mm -hmm. How much was him being a victim of your behavior? that it wasn't his fault, it was your fault. Um, how much did that permeate this, your relationship? It was, it was every step of the way. There was really no escaping it being my fault. It was how he managed it. It was how he controlled me, the so blame. What, so what's an what's a example of him 
you know, making something your fault? Um, well, one incident would be when I, well, when we would go out to the bars and I'd be getting ready and he would pick out everything that I was going to wear from top to bottom. And then we would go to the bars and he would get angry because the guys would look at me. And that was my fault too, even though he had picked out what I was going to wear. And then he would begin to manhandle me in the bars and it would start a bar fight because another guy would step in and say, hey, don't treat your woman like that. And so how, what were, how did he make it your fault? What did he say? Look, look at the fight you made me get into. It was your fault. And what was exactly your fault? The things that I wore, the things that I said, or the way that I acted wearing those clothes, it was my fault. So even though he picked out the clothes, now the clothes... It was because of what the clothes were when they were on me. Which was what? Which was they were too sexy. They were a turn on to guys. I was a slut or I was behaving like a slut in those clothes. Did he call you that? Yeah, he called me a slut. He'd call me a slut in the bars and other people could hear. So that's a belief that he has about you, right? Um, what are some of the other beliefs that he had that drove some of this behavior that you're talking about? What, you know, as he's lecturing you or when he's explaining things to you, um, what beliefs did you hear come out about how he thought about himself or what he gets to do or about you? He believed that he was always right. He believed that, that I didn't have any right to communicate anything that I had felt in that moment. I began to believe that too. I, I didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't say anything because he was, he was always right. I was always wrong. And if I said anything about it, then he would act like I was somehow diminishing him. So I didn't dare. Was there anything in your home that was yours? Everything, everything belonged to him. That was, that was the main belief. Me, the kids, the house, it all belonged to him. Everything belonged to him. In those moments, like when I was in the bar with him, I, I was not another person. I was a belonging. I belonged to him. How does it, just the impact of this accumulate on you? Like you're living with this man who is obviously shown his capacity to be physically violent. And now he's coercing you and he's threatening you um, to get his way. What's the impact on you? It's for me, for me, it was nearly impossible to exist as a separate identity because so much of my energy was focused on ducking and moving to be safe because I didn't always know what or the intensity of what was going to come from him. And so I had to be very, very aware of that. And it really, it, it, it hollowed me out inside emotionally to be on that level of, of anticipation of something bad happening all the time. I had to constantly anticipate his move. And so it wasn't always the same each time. So, so when it did happen, it was like I was ducking for cover. I was camouflaging in order to be safe. And that level of camouflage had to change with each incident. So it, what's camouflage mean? Well, it was kind of like he was a hunter. I was the prey. And so I had to change. I had to change my behavior if it meant, if it meant crying immediately. I had to know that that was going to or hope that it was going to stop him from doing what he was doing. Or if I had to stand very still and not breathe, or it felt like not breathing and just take whatever I had coming. 
then that's what that camouflage meant. And whatever I had to do in that moment to be safe. What were you camouflaging? What was the, what were you hiding? Well, I could have never said like when he came up to me at the stove, get out of my way or you're in my space or any of that. I was, I was not able to tell him that he was in so my space be or being scary or I couldn't be, yeah, I could not be myself. I could being able to express even just the very basic things that people get to tell their partner, I couldn't do. I couldn't say you're too close. I couldn't say I'm going to get burned or please step back or anything. Um, it wasn't even, I didn't even have the opportunity to attempt to be polite or civil and say, Hey, this pot's too close to the edge. Um, can you back off or, you know, nothing. There was no, no space to just breathe. So the camouflage was, was then you playing a role that you thought was going to, to uh, mitigate the threat? Absolutely. What happens when you play that role? Like how, I mean, you, it sounds like this is something that you had to manage on a daily basis. When you're doing that, that often, and you're playing roles that are not yourself, what happens? I became trained by him and I, my behavior became an extension of how he wanted me to be. One of the things that people outside your experience get confused by is how a woman loses herself in that space. Their notion is, is that if somebody told me something I didn't agree with, I would just disagree with it. What I'm hearing from you is that there was no space to disagree. So when you were, you know, when you're playing these roles to try and have some influence on what he's threatening, um, do you become those roles after playing them long enough? Absolutely. You have to continually adjust. You have to continually adjust your behavior to keep up with his. And, and, and it isn't necessary in some cases for him even to use the physical violence anymore because he is able to manipulate, coerce, and threaten, sometimes in the most subtle ways that other people don't even notice. And you know, you know that you have to obey in order to be safe. So it sounds like, from what you're describing, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that coercion and threats becomes what the main way that he uses these other tactics on the wheel like if he's going to emotionally abuse you it's it's right there if he's going to isolate you it's right there is that accurate or absolutely that's where he you know it, it, once he gets to that point then he he doesn't have to use those other tactics anymore um, what he what can do, the, he doesn't have to get to the point necessarily, like I said, where he is physical, but he can, you know, he can use threats with the kids. He can coerce her. Like if you want groceries and you have to sleep with me and it's not even that simple. There's a lot of other steps that he goes through in order to make it happen. So coercion and threats is a, is, a, you know, as all the tactics do, they represent women's experience in different ways in which he gets what he wants. But the other thing we understand about the wheel and, and how it was developed is that women talked about how he would use these different tactics simultaneously. But what, I, I mean, what I'm hearing from you is, is that coercion and threats really becomes a foundational tactic that underpins a lot of the other ways that he ends up using, like minimizes I am blame. Mm -hmm. isolation using kids sexual uh sexual abuse is that accurate yeah because he can threaten to take your car keys away then you're isolated he can coerce you into behaving in a certain way if say he has custody of the kids and you want to be able to see them then you end up you know sleeping with him or doing things that you would not otherwise want to do but he has that power and it like seems so simple, but it's not simple. And it is so painful to live through. 
Well, I want to thank you for what you've shared. Um, again, it's, it's going to make us better facilitators. This is why we have these conversations. And, um, and I just really honor and appreciate what you've, what you've, the gift you've given us today. So thank you. You're welcome. We are back. So um, lots of stuff, lots of stuff to unpack in there. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to send you an invitation. We want you to do that uh, work initially in your small group. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll process it as a group. So again, what did you hear happen to her? Um, how did she talk about uh, coercion threats differently than, than uh, Eric, uh, who's executing those tactics uh, uh, against his partner? Um, and what did you learn from her, um, especially around the notion of losing herself? Because that's the piece that the system tends to miss, I don't know, diagnose is probably not the word, but uh, misplace that. When somebody um, is acting outside of themselves, they think she's crazy. They think that her behavior is erratic. There's all of this way in which they take that up that is typically judging of her um, because they, they don't like, you can take an advocate like Olivia who understands this and worked with women who experienced it. And you can take somebody else who this isn't their work and you can look at the exact same event and see two completely different things going on. Part of what we're trying to do in this, this CCR lens about a shared understanding is that you want everybody to see the problem for what it is, right? Um, as opposed to impose their ideas, their notions, their theories. And the only way to really get there is to start talking to women in your community about what they're experiencing, both when the men abuse them and when they call for help, what happens? What's good, what isn't, right? What's the lens that we need to understand this problem in our community through? Okay, good. All right, so um, Jeff will send the invitation and we'll see you in 10 minutes. Okay, everybody's back. All right, who would like to kick off the conversation you had in your group about what you noticed, saw, paid attention to? I can go. Okay, Jen, uh, Janae? Yeah, Janae Hernandez. Hi, everyone. Right. Um, I was part of the breakout number seven. Um, so a lot of the things that we discussed was that um, County Cami essentially um, sounded as a prisoner, essentially, felt like she was consistently walking on eggshells and feelings of being trapped. Um, in reference to intent, um, we came up with intimidation, blame, and control. Um, and then the belief that she felt lost and that essentially she existed as a separate entity with the inability to be herself. Um, one of the things that we also discussed is that was interesting about camouflaging herself um, and having to adjust constantly uh, because of what he quote unquote wanted her to be. And also lastly was using the children, um, which is more prevalent even after the relationship has ended. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And notice that Eric made a threat. If you don't let me see my son, I'm gonna beat your boyfriend's ass. And then he did it. He said, if you don't do what I say, I'm gonna take your kids away from you. And he did it. Right. So we hear these things when we're working with women who are experiencing this harm about what he's threatened to do. And, you know, I, I just know that there's a lot of folks in the system who think that he's full of hot air. But she knows he isn't. She knows what he's capable of. She's lived with it. And we really need to have a way of taking that up um, when she tells us. So thank you. Janae, that was very helpful. All right, another group. How about group number four? Who's in group number four? Sophia? Hi, I, I, was, in group, I was in group number two. Um, okay. 
actually we're discussing how, um, of course, how vigilant she will have to be. Um, he had total control over her. Um, and um, everything that he do, he um, he was like he made it, made him be the victim. Like you did it, I'm the victim because of what you did. Now this is what's happening. Um, got control over her by getting the kids, of course. Um, he was very insecure, uh, low self esteem. Uh, How do you know that, first, Sophia? Um, by the way that, um, how pretty she is or, um, and made him, made him feel like, like that, like. Okay. So now this isn't, can I just use that for an example, Sophia? Sure. This is really good. Okay. So this is a really good example of what can happen in a CCR meeting where if we think that he's acting out of insecurity, then that, that leads us to one way of dealing with. The, the struggle. If we see him coming out of a place of entitlement, then it leads to a whole other way of dealing with him. So one of the things, and I actually knew her partner, there was no level of insecurity with this individual or low self-esteem, but um, he was a sniper uh, on the law enforcement, uh, uh, in the law enforcement agency he was in. And he had lots of uh, beliefs in, belief in himself. So one of the things is that people who are at the top of a hierarchy or a person at the top of a hierarchy are insecure. Just like feeling like a victim, they're also insecure. But part, but what drives it, right? So when you're trying to control another human being, every breath, every emotion, every action that she takes, that's going to lead to feelings of insecurity because you cannot control everything that she does, right? So he's not, he's insecure because he's battering her. He's not battering her because he's insecure, right? It's different. Take South Africa as an example during apartheid. White people had stone fences, barbed wire, and German shepherds in their yards because they knew what they were doing to the indigenous population of South Africa. And they were afraid. They were insecure, right? They were insecure because they were dominating a group of people, right? So if they didn't dominate them because they're insecure. They're insecure because they dominated them, right? So this is a great example of a conversation that can come up inside of a CCR that if we believe that he's actually insecure and has low self-esteem, that's gonna lead to a mental health therapeutic kind of intervention, right? But if he's entitled and he's acting out of hierarchy, that's a whole different analysis that leads to a whole different set of, of interventions, right? So thank you, Sophia, for that, that great uh, introduction to that. I would have not thought to bring it up, but, um, but, that's a, but that's the kind of stuff that comes up in CCR, right? At those table, at those big meetings. And who's gonna have a way of thinking about that to help the team um, kind of dissect it, right? Okay, Sophia, go ahead. You can continue. Did I lose you, Sophia? Sorry. All right. I'm back. Right, Sorry. Back. Good. All right. Good. Sorry, can you ask me the question again? Sorry, I missed that? I, I missed the, the, the last uh, sentence. Sorry. Oh. Um, you just said continue. Continue with. Oh, that. yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. Continue. Um, I just kind of I just jumped in there and I, I did I, you didn't finish so I want to make sure you had a chance to finish oh okay well basically we were just talking about the the control that he had over her and um how probably how insecure he uh he was um 
Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the law enforcement uh, status that he holds as uh -huh. well. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. And so what did you notice about how that impacted Cami? Um, that was too, uh, just sorry. a lot of control. Yeah, right. That she had to navigate all the time, right? So she said even if things were going really well, she had to be diligent because it, she knew it could turn on a dime, right? Correct. Yeah. Thank you, Sophia. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. And what group was that? Group two. Group two. Group two came yes. through. All right. Thank you. Who else wants to jump in with what their team talked about? I can talk a little bit about what our group talked about, but right, I don't know thanks, what number, group number. <laughs> I don't know what group number I was in. I okay. had been in two. A good one. It was a good group. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> so we had talked about something about how she lost herself or how it affected yeah. her, impacted her, and we talked about how the constant hum of never knowing when a good day could be, the switch could be flipped, um, and just obey and be safe. Um, and that just the basic stuff, you know, like her job and having food, that she was learning to change her camouflage, like she said, um, to adjust to what he was wanting, um, just for basic stuff. If you want groceries, you'd have to have sex with me and just the basic stuff and, and how she just couldn't even voice her opinion when she was standing in a stove by the stove and like you're in my space like she lost everything you know ability to um express herself um ability to go out with him that it wasn't going to be a big fight even though he controlled that you know what she would wear mm -hmm. so she just pretty much lost all control of anything to do with her choices yeah, and it wasn't that she didn't decide to do things outside of his demands or, or couldn't physically say something to him that was a difference, but she knew if she did, there's a consequence. There's always a consequence, right? So then I just don't, and I just don't. So if you're, if you're living with somebody who is using coercive control, um, you have basically three choices. You can submit to what he wants, you can fight him, or you could try to leave. And women experiencing that do all three at different times for different reasons. But there is a lot of submitting that goes on. And I know being raised in a home like this, that submitting keeps you safe right? Agreeing with whatever you're being called, that you're, you know, defective, that you're not good enough. If you agree with that, right, you're less likely to be harmed physically. But if you disagree with it, then there's a high likelihood something's coming, right? So there's a lot of that submission that goes on. And when you submit and you submit and you submit and you submit under those conditions, then sometimes the analysis of who you are as a person becomes who you are as a person because you're just trying to navigate and avoid the threat, right? Lester. Uh, I'm kind of curious, Scott, because uh, she was she lived in a small town. He was a police officer. They all, police officers stick together. And like you said, she had to go 30 miles to, to get help. What was, how did that happen? What motivated her to get through this, to get, to get out of this uh, situation and then to take the risk to go 30 miles away? Yeah, I mean, just amazing. Just what, just what I have seen so many times in, in working with women is, is just an amazing heart, an amazing resilience, an amazing desire to have a life. Um, and to do what it takes. Now, it took her years to get to that point, right? This wasn't just a Wednesday decision. Um, and she also, when she got her order for protection, or was gonna, she got the, um, 
she got one signed, but the final hearing hadn't taken place. She actually withdrew it because she knew that if she followed through and got the order, which she would have, which, which she would have, he'd have lost his ability to carry, which, which could have jeopardized his job. And she knew the only thing that was really keeping her alive was his job because he wanted to be a police officer, right? So she knew she couldn't get that order for protection against him. Right. So, I mean, this is the, these are the kind of rock and hard place decisions. And somebody from the outside is going to say, well, you should have had an order against him without asking what's the risks in doing so. Right. These are the questions we always, have. I'm sitting in a room because um, I used to do forensic interviews of kids who were sexually abused. I'm observing a case where it's a domestic violence um, case and the social worker is at the table and she says, um, well, I don't know if all of this matters anyway, because they had just interviewed the child um, for because the child had witnessed some domestic violence. I don't know if this matters anyway, because she's picking her husband um, or her boyfriend over the kids anyway. And I said, how do you know that? And she said, well, because I keep setting up visits for her across the at the park across the street. And she always tells me that she's going to wait for Eddie to get home before she comes over. So she, clearly he's more important than the kids are. I said, well, the first thing that comes to my mind is that these aren't Eddie's kids. And one of the risk factors for severe injury and homicide is an abusive man like this living with kids that are not his own, right? For all a host of reasons. So my question is, does she, does she have an idea of what he would do if he came home and she wasn't there? waiting for him. Because I know when I was a kid, if my dad was at work and he was coming home, my mom had to get us all cleaned up. We were on the porch and we were greeting our father. When my mom was gone and came home, we didn't have to do that, but we had to do it for him. So first question is, what is it like for her when she's not there when he gets home? Second question I have is, those aren't his kids. So when she's over across the street, across the street from the house and he gets home and sees this, does he come over and say or do something in front of the social worker that makes it harder for her to get her kids back? Because that would benefit him, right? So these are not simple cases. This is why people who are interveners, regardless of what your vantage point is, are frustrated by domestic assault cases because of the complexity. We have to be able to ask the questions, but to ask the questions, we have to be able to understand the space, right? Yeah. Very Scott, good. Our, our group uh, focused a little bit on the, uh, the bar scene and all of us have heard, you know, for, for many years have, having facilitated groups, uh, have heard the bar scene from the batter's lens, uh, but I, we, were, we were kind of at awe at, uh, at her lens from, you know that that whole bar scene in which she was experiencing, uh, and so I, I that was part of our part of our discussion was like, you know, from from that perspective. And so I, I just wanted to kind of put that out there because our group really focused on that as something was you know the way she described it and and uh, uh, completely different than what the batter would describe it. You know, even if the batter can get to the point where they say, yeah, I recognize that what I did was wrong, and you know, but uh, her her description of that was pretty pretty um uh, an eye opener for a lot of us or at least for me so, so what's the what's the narrative that you hear in men's group um uh, the the narrative here to Lynn's group is from again from his perspective he's he's um you know he can get to the point where he can describe but it's it's much more simplistic but um uh, than that her her complex way of, of of looking at it um not sure how to, how to describe the narrative i um, well, you tell me if I'm, if I'm touching on it, because I mean, I've been in the same room with those guys for many, many years, right? Uh, she's always flirting with everybody. No. She's talking to guys I don't know. Um, she's acting in ways that are stupid, right? Like it's just all this stuff. About Usually dress, dress comes up uh, as she dress, described. You know, yeah, like she's she chose to wear this this night, you know? And, and, uh, right. And she shouldn't be wearing that stuff, yeah. right? Um, and then you listen it to her perspective. She didn't get, she didn't get to choose what she wore, yeah. right? Yeah, but then it was still a problem, right? 
So that's that's this space, right? In a, in, in a sort of a nutshell, um, that's the space she's got. In. Now, women who are experiencing this harm will respond in a multitude of ways to this. Some will just absolutely physically fight back. Um, of the three things, fight, leave, or submit, some women are going to submit more than others. Some women are going to fight more than others. Some women are going to try to leave quicker more than others, right? Other women are going to stay longer than others. All those things are true, right? There's a lot of diversity when it comes to how do women individually respond when their partner is, is treating them this way, right? We have to have that, that scale open to us. Um, I'm still waiting for that really simple, clear domestic case that uh, where you get the perfect victim and the um, stereotypical offender to come through and it just doesn't happen, right? There's a lot of layers that we have to be able to have tools to, to figure out, intervene with, um, to get at them so that we understand in this particular case, what is all going on? Yeah, and not look for the simple route because there isn't one. Any other thoughts or, or comments before we move to the next thing? Okay, uh, Jeff, do you wanna pull up the next slide? So we've had a project going for the last three years where we've been listening to hundreds of hours of men's groups from different programs uh, uh, you know, in the country and, in, and, and one in Australia, actually. And the person who's doing some analysis for us has listened to all the things, ways in which the men are answering questions in men's group. And she said, basically, nine out of 10 responses in a men's group can be put into these four categories. Whatever the question is, whatever they're talking about, it's within the normal range of disagreements in a relationship, right? Second, he's doing nothing wrong or trying to make the best of a difficult situation. The problem lies mainly with his ex-partner or his kids or both. And finally, the problem is primarily caused by a complicating factor like substance abuse, um, the system or some other factor, right? Essentially, this is the explanation for why he's doing what he's doing the majority of the time, right? When you're, again, this is listening to men explain themselves in a men's group setting. All right, so this was interesting to me. Um, and so what I, what I, uh, I also knew that this is the way that a lot of us end up explaining ourselves when we're in a, not, not we're in abusive situations, but hey, you know what? I didn't, I didn't yell. Okay. <laughs> this is just a normal disagreement, right? This isn't something that, that you need to be concerned about, right? Like we always have this way of minimizing and it's more of a cultural thing that the men are drawing upon. It really isn't just men who, who are battering that are doing this. It's, it's like a cultural thing. So I had this idea. I, I read this quote by Ellen. Could you go to the next slide? Well, it'll come up. Um, that made me think, let me go to the media and just see if I can find examples of this. And it didn't take me long. These are all excerpts from media reports of domestic homicides. And you can find the exact same way the media is responding to a domestic homicide as the men did in men's group. It's within the normal range of disagreements. Accused described as an otherwise law-abiding citizen who became embroiled in a rocky marriage and then killed her right? It's more than a rocky marriage when you end somebody's life. Um, he's doing nothing wrong or trying to make a best of a difficult situation. We've all made mistakes we wish we could take back. I want people to know Trevor was the kindest guy. It wasn't like Trevor to do anything to hurt anyone. And then he killed his partner, right? So we talked about how this is a bigger issue than a toxic relationship between two people. This is cultural, right? It goes much deeper than that. And so part of what this, um, I link to when I see this is what the men say in group. When we ask them, when you leave here, how are you gonna stay straight? And one guy, again, just like articulated it the best, I thought of, of a version of this is to say, do you know how many times 
as a man, I get invited to be the guy who got me here in a day, right? Like nobody's inviting me to be the guy that we're trying to become in here. But I walk out of these doors and the music I listen to, the church I go to, the school I go to, the TV I watch, all tell me I'm the guy who gets to decide. And then I come in here and we don't, right? How am I supposed to stay straight, right? It's a critique of the culture he's living in, right? And how deep this goes. Uh, next slide, Jeff. This is just two more examples that you could read on your own if you go to the next slide, Jeff. This is what uh, precipitated me to look at the uh, media. Uh, it was a quote by Ellen, that I, a piece that she had written uh, some time ago when there was a lot of school shootings of that, that students in K through 12 um, educational schools were bringing firearms and killing their fellow students. And she says, one of the things that the media does over and over again, which divorces people from the actual experiences of oppression or an ability to understand oppression is the perpetuation of an ahistorical view of women's lives. So every day you see media reports of women being killed by their intimate partner, but nobody's linking the scope of the problem together. It's always a report on this, a report on this, like they're all in a vacuum, right? And your CCR teams can end up thinking the same way because that's the way the media presents it, right? So at the bottom, she, she talks about the fact that this method of decontextualizing what is going on uh, with those boys who are bringing school, guns to school, the question isn't why are our youth more violent? The question was in this particular instance, why were there white young males bringing guns to school and killing their fellow students? Because that was what actually was happening, right? Um, but that's not what gets named. Um, and again, that, that way of covering up what oppression looks like. What we're doing in our CCR is exposing the violence, finding ways to see it, understand it and respond to it. Right. All right, next slide. So this is what makes it hard is because his presentation to all of you is gonna be through this minimize, deny and blame tactic, right? Um, there's what he's done to his partner and that is what he's, there's what he tells everybody else, right? Um, and how he frames it. Most of what we do know about the abuse is from, an inst from institutional documentation, right? So Alexandria brought up the fact that if they never call the, the, they never call the police, then you don't have that institutional documentation, which means we probably are not going to have any history other than if she feels safe enough to tell us, um, which again is the tip of the iceberg. And then he has a lack of insight into his, the extent and nature of his abuse, and he doesn't want to talk about what he's done. Both things are true. And if you've worked in a rehabilitation format, you know that when guys come into the program and when guys leave six months or a year later, they know a tremendously greater amount about who they are and what they've done than they did the day they walked in, right? So part of it is he doesn't want to tell you. The other part of it is he actually doesn't even know. He doesn't even see it, right? It's not even in his lens to lie to you about, right? So both are true. Next slide, Jeff. So here's an example of a guy in men's group. Now this individual, um, when, you, when you read the police report, what he had done is he was at a bar with his uh, girlfriend and they were, um, there was a couple times that he had talked to a woman on the phone and it created some bit of an argument between the two of them. So now they're done with the bar, they get in the car, they go back to her house. They're at her house, now they're in her bed, and they're having sex when he starts texting uh, another woman while they're having sex. She notices this, says, get the F out of my house, tries to kick him out of the bed, and then he beats her up badly, okay? Um, and then he ends up getting arrested for that. 
his first time in the men's group when he's invited to say, so tell us why you got here. This is what he says. Well, it was a domestic assault, but I mean, it was just fighting. And, you know, she was wailing on me and started just hitting and hitting just like, and I was just drunk. And that's, and that's like the way, like, and then I ended up hitting her too. And, you know, to kind of show her that, you know, you don't hit people. Like, I haven't hit you the whole time. What did I do to deserve this? And then, I don't know, after that, I was just trying to get out of the house and leave, and it's already late. I have a DUI, so I couldn't just drive, and I just wanted to stay till morning. She gets jealous, real jealous, I guess. That's his understanding of that event, right? What is real? And what he just said, it was a domestic assault. I was drunk. I hit her. I have a DUI. That's it. The rest of it is a complete fiction, right? It isn't real. So here's where it makes it difficult. If you're a social worker and you're intervening in a, in a, with a family and you've got to have a substantive conversation with him about what he's done. If you're a probation agent and you're doing a pretrial release uh, study or you're supervising a new client, right? And you're trying to help him get to a new place. If you're a community member, right, like a pastor, and you're going to this person and you're asking them to tell you what's going on, this is the kind of stuff you're likely to get. So it, I had one person say as a facilitator, I got to develop a third ear. I have to have a different way of listening for what could be true and what is minimized and I am blamed because there's so much of it, right? So I think what, um, what David pointed out that if you're a men's group and that's the main way you understand the problem, then you're going to be limited on how deep you understand it <laughs> because they're limited and how deep they understand themselves. So you have to balance that with a, a firm understanding of what victims experience because that gives you a different way to hear what you're, what he's saying, right? It's the same thing in a CCR. If we don't balance out what we know from the people who primarily work with offenders um, in whatever system that is, with the experience of victims, we will have a limited understanding of the problem, which is why focus groups with women experiencing this harm is so important as a foundational piece to creating um, effective interventions within our community, right? Don't go to the folks that have limited understanding of, and insight into their behavior. Go to the people subject to it because they're the ones that have to navigate it. They're the ones who have to know how to, like, she's at the bottom. She knows a lot more about him than he does. She has to. That's what keeps her safe. When my dad came home, he had a gray, hard plastic lunchbox and it would go down on the top of a wooden topped dishwasher portable dishwasher by the door how that door closed how that lunchbox went down on that dishwasher told me everything i needed to know about whether i was going upstairs or staying in my in my bedroom in the basement okay i my dad would have no insight into that he's just doing what he does i had to know it because it's what kept me safe. So you build the responses with the people at the bottom. This is who you partner with, the people who are subject to the oppression. They're the ones that can name the reality of the abuse as a way to manage the people at the top. All right, which is the Duluth model essentially. That, that's, that's, a, that's one of the cornerstones of the Duluth model. All right, um, next slide, Jeff. Um, so to reveal the tactics being used, a community response must develop a coordinated response that is grounded in the reality of what happens. Victim experience, now it's linked to the tactics of, of control. Use this understanding to develop specific tools that both expose the violence and position government interveners to impose accountability if that's what your community response is going to fo be focused on doing. Um, if it's not government officials, then somebody's going to have to have some leverage 
um, over him to be able to impose some level of consequence that's meaningful to him. And then if systems can impose accountability, this makes rehabilitation possible and community safety more likely because he's gonna go to a rehabilitation program that um, um, gives a, a stronger likelihood that he's willing that he that he could that he might change, right? Um, if he if if you just have a coordinated response, um, you're going to get some guys that change because they don't want the consequences that come with their behavior. But if you want a greater number of men to change, they have to be given the opportunity to do so. But they're not going to just take it. They're not just going to just volunteer for that. You're going to have to leverage them in somehow um, to get them to go, at least initially. And that's what your CCR can do. All right, next slide, Jeff. All right, so that's the problem. Thoughts, comments, ideas. Think about your own CCRs. Think about your own community. Think about if there's a great diversity in how people analyze or think about the, why the problem exists. What's gonna be the hurdle? David. One of the things that I like, uh, there's a lot that I like about what you're saying, Scott, um, is the uh, when you when you talk about why does the perpetrator say what he's saying, and you said because that's that's all he has. He doesn't have anything more than that. Um, I th take that one step further, and that is a reflection on the world around him that we've never expected him to have anything better than that to say mm -hmm. so he doesn't have that which right. really goes to what you're saying also about having this be a survivor centered practice because if we're left to our own devices we're the ones that created the opportunity for him to not really have much to say about his behavior so how can we solve it we have to have that driven by her knowledge, her experience, uh, and her, her input. So, yeah, very go, well go, said. Go on, brother. <laughs> <laughs> no, you go on. I wish I'd have said that. <laughs> yeah, and on the flip side, David, what you're going to see when we get to the focus group stuff tomorrow and the transcript you're going to read is that one of the biggest complaints about government systems towards victims is that they fail to cooperate. They don't participate, they don't show up. But when government systems operate that the way that they do, it actually alienates victims from the process and doesn't give them any incentive to do so. So the very thing they're criticizing is the thing they're creating and then blaming victims uh, for the problem. Yeah. It's fascinating when you start breaking it down. Others. How about folks in government systems? Prosecution, law enforcement. What are you thinking about what we've been talking about so far up to this point? Anybody care to share? You know, Scott, as far as from probation standpoint, right, if you're doing a thorough victim interview, that's going to help you know contextually, you know, how dangerous the man may be. Mm -hmm. But then if I've done this in probation and it becomes part of my pre-sentence investigation, now all that information is available to the judge and the mm -hmm. offender, right? So then there are some, sometimes you don't want that information, right? So you're thinking, I'm hearing you talking about that. I was like, oh, this is wonderful, but how do I get this information into a batter's intervention program in a way that doesn't cause collateral damage or consequences to the survivor for discussing that or talking about that? And so that, that's mm -hmm. where it becomes really complicated. Right now, we just started running a, a women's group and I have some women who have been sent to that program. I don't do the program, but who are in there and their partners are on my program. 
And then I hear the stories and they're completely different than what's being disclosed in mine. And yet I don't bring that back to group because, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, but it, then it's like, oh my God, this guy's getting a slide by because he's nowhere is he talking about any of this stuff, right? Um, so I don't know what's your thoughts on that and how do we bring as much of that information back into our group and how have you thought about doing that in a way that doesn't cause retaliation on that person for coming forward and being honest? Are you talking about specific things that they've done? So Jim, I just got to say, I know that you're really frugal but you, you, I think you still have electricity, don't you? Yeah, I do, I know. I, uh, I don't use it very often, but let me go turn on the light. Okay. Um, I'll do that for you. There's well, something my, just electric a... bill, my electric bill is $31 a month, so that will tell you how frugal I really am. Um, well, today Scott, it's going to go to 32. Jim, Jim's, Jim's hamster is on lunch break. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, like, um, so... Yeah, just the amount, the, the level of violence that went on in this family and the extremes of, of violence that went on, um, and primarily from him. Now, this the, the victim is not without violence, right? And she owns up to her part way, way, way better than he owns up to his part. But then when you hear, so it's like at 85, 15, but she probably admits to 90 <laughs> and his, he's 10. Right. Um, and so you almost want to like call him out on it because, you know, you have all this new information um, and for kind of get, trying to get accountability statements, trying to get, you know, some admissions to stuff. And you just you can't. So you're kind of stuck there. And all you can do is hope that he learns through osmosis. Right. To the guys who are being more honest and what, how we're dissecting things and, and stuff. So I just wondered what your thoughts were. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Now that I can see it, it's good to see you. Um, <laughs> so the so the part of it is in a men's group, the way that we would think about it is that um, a brand new guy in group doesn't really have um, a lot good to say. So I'll often say to him, hey, I know that you're new to this group. I know that you don't know anybody here. You don't trust anybody here. Everybody else has been here for a while. So if you want to just take the first few weeks and just listen to how these guys do group with us, please take it, right? Um, and then invite him to actually let the other guys show him how to be in process in the room, right? Rather than just have him start off by spinning his wheels um, and, and telling me all kinds of stuff that isn't, that isn't grounded in reality. Why waste a group time, right? Yeah. He needs to listen to other men do the work more than he needs to talk. So I invite him to do that. Now, on the flip side, um, the system needs to know the details because they need to manage his risk and impose some, some, some uh, boundaries on him based on how much risk he poses to the victim. So they need to know that detail. Um, but here's someplace in the middle, child protection, right? So when you're in a, an investigative unit within child protection, uh, in Minnesota at least, you have 45 days to complete your investigation. That's almost no time, right? So I sit down and I watch one social worker after another interview these guys on, who have uh, been arrested for domestic assault uh, that involve children. And, um, and one after another, they just clam up, they get into arguments, the social worker gets, like their cheeks get red, they're so angry. Um, and I'll say to them afterwards, what were you trying to do? What was making you so frustrated? in that conversation. And it's because I, I wanted to get him to admit. I said, but you're, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> He's not gonna come in to a government institution and have a Perry Mason moment, throw himself on the table and say, this is what I, I've done. He's not gonna do that. And you're not gonna be good enough to get him to do that. So why get mad at him for it, right? But, but there are things you're gonna do and could do when you interview him, pose questions to him to get him to talk about his life, both as a partner and a father. Evaluate him for his level of risk because you can do that, right? So give him opportunities to have insight, to give you some insight into who he is. The less insight he has, the more risky he is to do this again. 
So then at the end of this conversation, when you've got a guy who's stonewall, 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 and is giving you nothing, right? Then you can say, okay, so have you read the police report? I have. Well, so have I. And I, and I understand that you're saying this is all lies. But I'm believing what is in this police report. Now, I'm not, she's not talking about the victim. She's talking about the police report, right? I believe what's in this police report. And I'm going to act accordingly that you are a threat to her and the kids. And as long as you sit across from me and try to convince me that you didn't do anything and there's, you had no part in this at all, then I'm going to assume that you're just as risky today as you were the day you did this. The only way that's going to shift is if you begin to come to me and start giving me some insight into your role as a father and as a partner and how to keep the family safe if you're around. That will help me understand something different. But until then, this is what we're going to do. Now, interestingly, social workers, child protection investigators were doing that. They were acting, they were doing everything I just said, but they weren't telling him that, right? Why don't you tell him that that's what you're going to do? Be clear with him. You're not disrespectful. You're not, you're just being clear. This is what's going to happen going forward. And it's an invitation to him to start having some insight about what he's done, right? So that's that, that's that space where you get interveners either from the community, probation like Jim, because he wants to have a qualitative conversation because that's his role in the CCR. Child protection workers, the same thing, right? <clears throat> that's why I think child protection and probation are really natural allies because probation tends to have more leverage on getting guys to do what they want to do. CPS has less, but they both want the same thing, right? And CPS knows things that probation doesn't know. Probation knows things that CPS doesn't know. And there's a partnership that can, that can form that I think could be really helpful um, to getting this guy to shift or to do things that he might not normally do right, um, or go to programs he might not normally go to um, that CPS couldn't in, in their wildest dreams get him to go to, but, but probation could, right? So that's where the CCR comes in. If we all act out of our own silo, probation's got a silo, CPS has got a silo. Probation can't solve this problem by themselves. Police can't, judges can't, prosecutors can't, child protection workers can't. Maybe if we get everybody together, working in partnership, linking our policies and protocols together, maybe we got a shot at this, right? But there's no way we're going to solve this uh, sticking in our silos. We're going to have to work across the, the aisle, right? I don't know if I ever answered your question, Jim. <laughs> well, I don't know. That's fine. You know, it's interesting um <coughs> hush hush dogs sorry about that um one of the uh new things that we just started doing with just a couple clients that's given me a lot of information is um these when uh they're including me on the emails that they send to the victim the guardian at light um child protection like so we're, we're all part of this kind of the family court thing Holy cow, it's, it's totally different. Like, he doesn't play those games in group. But, you know, batterers are really charismatic and engaging as long as they're getting what they want. And yeah. you're not saying no, right? And so in my program, he knows what he has to do, and he knows he's going to be held account to that. And he can do that. He can jump through those hoops. He's care, You know, he can engage. He can admit to what he needs to admit. When he doesn't get a response from guarding at items or he doesn't get a response from getting the If you can hear us, Jim, we're losing you. You froze up on us. Looks like his looks like the hamster took another break. Uh, and I don't know if we're going to do that with everybody, but it's really been interesting. Just, but I tell you what, as far as case management, it it's very time consuming, right? Um, yeah. We want to do this for every client. They they don't fund. I can do it because I just don't get paid for it. But honestly, if I had employees that I was paying hourly. Uh, an agency couldn't afford the amount of time it would really to be able to do that great. Okay, so what Jim brings up is a really great point. <clears throat> so if that's an effective intervention, then who do we design it for? Because we can't design it for everybody. So then who gets in? 
right? In Duluth, we have a, excuse me, we have a restorative justice response that we've developed over the last 15 years. It is really time intensive, it takes lots of volunteers. Um, we can't do that for 350 guys a year, but we can take the repeat offenders that have gone through the response we've de designed and it did not have an effect and put them into that because that's a much smaller group of folks um, to deal with. Most of the guys, we don't have to put in that because what we've designed works. But for this group, 15 to 20% of guys, we need a different response. We need to add something to it, right? So what James talked about is a really good example of that. Um, but then how do you resource it, right? Great idea, but how do you resource it? All right, any other thoughts? Uh, Lester. Yeah, here in San Juan County, we've got a, a little bit of that, Scott, because um, we have compliance officers and treatment providers all in the same building. We're all connected to the same agency. So we get a referral from magistrate court, uh, and then we have access to, to uh, uh, Odyssey. And so we see that, that they have a criminal, rec a criminal record of of domestic violence charges. You know, and usually when I see a guy to do, and I'm doing an assessment, I'll say, so how many, how many times have you been in domestic violence? He'll say, well, those were all dismissed. And we'll say, well, you were in, you in those issues, you were in those situations. Uh, and then we also, uh, uh, we have a compliance part where we set them up in our program and, and we report uh, um, non-attendance or non-compliance to the compliance officer who reports to magistrate court. So we've got a little bit of that. We don't have mm -hmm. co connection with any of the, the victim stuff at all. But mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah, so then the question is, so like if Lester said, where do you live, Lester? Santa County. In Santa Bell? In New Mexico, yeah. Okay, so if, if Lester said, Scott, come on down to Sanibel County and do it a bit of a, 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 an audit for gaps in our system, the first thing I would, would, would wanna do is say, let's get a group of women whose partners have gone through that accountability process that Lester just described and say, what was the impact on you when the guys were in here, right? What do you wish they would have known? What, do you, what are they doing that was helpful? Because we don't wanna lose any of that, right? Um, and I, I assure you that your response will, will expand. It will be, and you will have much more confidence that you're doing what you should be doing because you've talked to the people who are subject to your intervention, right? That's interesting because we do have a connection with the local shelter through our CCR meeting. So maybe that's, that's uh, I'm getting excited about that. So <laughs> Yeah, right, right. It, it's, there is nothing richer um, I've learned so much of what I know from sitting in those rooms, listening to women describe and tell the stories of their lives um, about what it meant to have the system come in. It was a complete failure. It was the, most, the best thing that ever happened to me and everything in between, right? Um, and then go to them and say, how would you recommend we change that, right? Um, Man, I mean, it's just, it, it um, I remember we have, a, we have a thing in Minnesota called a domestic abuse no contact order. It is a criminal no contact order that gets issued at arraignment. It can be issued at arraignment on domestic assault cases. So if it gets issued and the guy violates it, it's actually another crime. It's not just a violation of conditions, it's a new crime, okay? So it's a serious no contact order. Um, there's no provision in Minnesota statute to tell a victim one of these has been issued. So, so the woman never knows that her partner has got this Danko against him, right? So we wanted to build that in. So uh, with all my years of experience, I sat down and wrote up uh, with an advocate this little short thing about Dankos and how you could contact somebody after the arrest to have an influence as to whether it gets issued or if it gets issued with what conditions, right? And so we bring it to a focus group of women and I put it in front of them and I say, so what do you think of this? And I remember a woman picking it up and she looked at it like this and she said, yeah, that's not gonna work. <laughs> she threw it back on the table. And I thought, well, <laughs> really felt 
strongly about that. <laughs> I think I did a good job, you know? And I said, so what's wrong with it? And she said, Scott, it's two-sided, right? It's 2.30 in the morning. You're going to give me all this to read? My kids are upset. I got to work the next day. My husband just got arrested. And now I'm going to sit and read three paragraphs on a Danko? It's not going to happen. I said, okay, would you as a group of women be willing to work on editing this to something that you would read? What is now on our police blue card, that we call it, which has all the victim rights on it, well, it's on that blue card is a piece that was written by and for victims of domestic assault, right? And it's better than I could have ever made it. As David said, I could talk for four days. I can write the same way. <laughs> and they just said, no, not going to work for us. You've got to bring this down to what's important. I didn't know what was important to a woman standing in those shoes. They did, right? Another example, prosecutor's office comes to us and says, we've been sending victim letters out for years and we hardly get any of them back and we don't know why. I know you're doing a series of focus groups. Could you bring this letter and just talk to them about why they wouldn't, why they don't want to respond to this? Go to the focus group, say, this is the letter. Would you respond to this? And almost universally, the women said, no, wouldn't send it back. Why? Number five, look at number five. It says, what do you, what would you like to have happen in this case for the defendant? And they said, the state wants me to make a decision about what's going to happen to them. And I want no part of this. I'm never sending this back. Now that's actually not what they were asking, but that's what it looked like they were asking. And that one question ended it. 10 years, they send this letter out and never get any back because of one question, number five, right? If they'd have started in focus groups with women to develop that letter, they'd have had a whole different response. But the experts decided. And then there was the gap. Yeah. All right. So we missed our break. <laughs> we're late so um these this these epiphanies come to me just <laughs> out of the blue so let's take our 15 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll finish out the day all right see you soon okay we are back um there was a dog barking in our little scene there just waiting for a few just, Turn the turn the uh, turn your cameras back on. Let's see if you're back. Great, thank you all. I appreciate it. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to move into structure. If that's the problem, then what are what's the structure that we try to solve the problem through? Um, so Jeff, do you want to pull up the first slide? All right. So when I get pulled into different communities, um, organize it, ones that have got something in place, um, this is typically what I end up finding one of these three things. I either find, um, coordinating councils, which I believe would be the equivalent of judicial councils, um, that you have in New Mexico, um, grant driven justice projects. Um, or Duluth model type CCRs. Um, so let's talk about the first one. All right, coordinating council, a group of governmental and community-based agencies that form a committee that meets typically once per month to discuss cases, events, and problems, okay? Um, the structure and agenda tends to be led by criminal justice agency or figure. Now, that isn't inherently bad, but the downside of it is, is that when you have all these criminal justice government based positions in the room and an advocate and somebody from the men's program, the conversation gets dominated by professionals um, in the room. And again, what I, and this is my experience, I'm not saying this happens in every single coordinating council, but in my experience, when I listen to it, 
like just can I attend a meeting and watch what happens, they end up talking about the problems that that the offenders and the victims create for them as practitioners, or they complain about what each other does or didn't do in relation to a particular case, right? And if they're doing case review, then somebody's sitting there and I can just feel the tension in the room where they say, all right, so we're gonna do this case review on this uh, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson here. Um, so uh, was, did the, did the police arrived, yes. Um, did you do the risk form? And you can just see like, I don't work for you. I don't answer to you. I don't, why, why are you, was, who's not in law enforcement, asking me questions about what I'm supposed to be doing? Right, you can just feel that thing um, in the room. So there's just a lot of different ways. It's like, it's like a group of folks that get together to analyze the problem. But then when I ask, what does anybody do different because of this meeting that you have 12 times a year, then it, it, we, not much, right? Um, it doesn't move very fast if it does, because you don't get together that often, right? And all the work is done in that meeting as opposed to outside the meeting. Um, again, this is typically what I see. Um, I'm not saying that this is how it, I have not watched judicial councils in New Mexico, so I don't know that space. I'm just saying what I've seen in different states as I've traveled around. Um, the power of the group tends to, to lean criminal justice because of who's in the room. Um, problems tend to get defined by how they impact the criminal justice system as opposed to how the criminal justice system impacts victims. Um, hard to name interagency response gaps due to the number of group members present. What that means is, is that um, it's hard to say that there's a problem with the way that law enforcement's responding when the sheriff's department's sitting there, right? Because nobody wants to say, have their agency outed in front of other criminal justice agencies. Every criminal justice agency, every human service group of agencies, there's politics between them. There always is that have nothing to do with what you're there for. And those politics come into the room with them. And now you're going to call somebody out in front of somebody else. And they, you, may, you may not have the intent to call somebody out, but that's what it feels like um, to them. Right. And so when I interview them individually, I, I've very rarely have I heard any practitioner say, I love that. <laughs> they just don't. They wish they weren't there um, when it's happening. All right. Um, and then coordinating councils tend to have high turnover and low commitment. So because the meeting doesn't seem to pertain to everybody in the room, um, as, as, as one of the folks this morning said, uh, I think it was Angela, that you end up doing a lot of the presenting. Everybody else just kind of listens. And then they go home and, I mean, what's the commitment to embrace what, what Angela was presenting, right? What's, if you're going to tell me this, then what am I supposed to do with it? That's probably the, the conversation. Um, if we want them to know something, what are we going to have them do? Now I have to wrestle with what you want me to do with it. Um, now you've got traction. Now they want to show up because they don't want you making decisions about that without them. Um, so that's one way to kind of, increase commitment to those meetings because now there's a reason to go, right? Um, okay, that's coordinating councils. Um, uh, that, that's how that's organized, um, typically. Grant-driven justice projects. This is for communities that don't have a whole, maybe they got a coordinating council going, but they write a grant to encourage arrest through VAWA. They get a few hundred thousand dollars to do, a, to do three years of work and the work lasts as long as the money does. And when the money runs out, the work stops, right? Because that's what the money was for, was to pay people to do a job. What we suggest, instead of getting the money to pay people to do a particular job, use the money to transform the way the system processes cases, takes up cases, right? Um, because then when the money runs out, the sustainability is you've already changed the way it happens, right? Um, yeah, 
So I, a hand up. Q. Hi, it's Q again. Um, yes. So I am the OVW campus coordinator for um, for UNM, and that's been one of our greatest challenges. Is we're now coming. We got a no cost extension, but we're now coming to the end of our three years, and we're having a really hard time having buy-in from the institution. We want to continue on the work, continue on all our working groups and everything that we've built so far that also we weren't actually able to really implement because of the pandemic since we were not on campus. And that's, I think, the, one of the biggest challenges that we're having is that the institution is like, well, you had your money for those three years and not wanting to put in funding to continue the work that we're still having many issues with when we have students coming in all the time with issues like this. And so um, what are your suggestions for trying to um, convince the institution and those that have the, <laughs> the ability to provide those resources to buy into this kind of work? Okay, so could you just tell the group, what was the, what, what is the overarching kind of goal of the grant that you wrote? What were you trying to achieve? So our, I mean, just like any campus, our campus was having some issues with, especially um, with specific part, parts of campus where there were a lot of um, reporting of domestic violence and interpersonal violence and dating violence. And so our goal was to address those issues, primarily through prevention education, but also through programs and policies within the institution um, that better supported victims, because a lot of what was happening was some of the allegations were against athletes or people in you know, fraternities or in positions where they had a lot of support. They would say, these women are making these things up. They're out to get these athletes because they're stars. They're out to get these fraternity guys because it's, you know, what, um, you know, they have something against them. And so ways to better support the victims through that process. And so, yeah, part of that was through prevention education. There's one of our working groups is engaging men and masculine people and just things like that to try and address these issues. But as I was mentioning, a lot of that was just halted by the pandemic because a lot of those efforts were being done in person originally and then everything, you know, everybody got sent home. And now we're seeing an increase in cases also because people were locked up or in quarantine in very unhealthy situations. So now I think more than ever, we need, you know, this funding to continue and these efforts to continue on campus. And it just, I think also because of the pandemic, the institution thinks, well, we have to, you know, provide our resources to other things just to keep the university afloat. Um, but while doing that, just not acknowledging the, the needs of our, our survivors on campus. Okay. All right. So, we, uh, uh... Q presents a really uh, just almost textbook example of when you use VAWA funds on a limited grant project to provide a service, it's really hard to keep that service going after the money runs out because nobody wants to do it. So here's, what, here's a version of what we did in Duluth to try and accomplish what um, Q was talking about. So we created this domestic violence response team and we paid for part of a investigator. So there was financial support to the police department for that. We paid part of a probation agent, which was support to St. Louis County probation uh, and parole. And then there was um, uh, money for a coordinator, right? And, and then there was advocate, um, for some financial support for an advocate to show up from the American Indian Housing Organization and from Safe Haven Shelter for Better Women. So this is the core team of people, right? We have three years to figure this out. So one of the things we have to do is reroute cases. So when a case comes into the police department that's domestic, it goes to the sergeant, the sergeant to the prosecutor. Now it's gonna go from, it's gonna go from the patrol officer actually to admin who cleans up the report then it goes to the sergeant, then it goes to the divert team, then it goes to the prosecutor. So the divert team would then process every one of those cases. The argument that we made to the police department is, is that if we have a domestic violence response team, we will now have a embedded resource for your patrol officers on executing the domestic violence policy that you need. That will take time, that'll free up time 
from your sergeants and your lieutenants who are constantly coaching their teams on executing the policy. Now you've got somebody else that does that, right? The other thing we're going to do is that we're going to do a risk evaluation. And that risk evaluation is going to be used by the prosecution, the bench, and pretrial release, and probation at the end, and the men's program at the end. But those three up, up front. And we believe that it's going to be su of such value that it's not going to be something that anybody wants us to stop doing. But here's the deal. If we're successful in pulling this off, then when the money runs out, if this is of value to the police department, you'll continue to pay for that investigator. If it's of value to our agency, then we will change our structure and prioritize that job and pay for that person to be there going forward. Safe Haven did the same, ACO did the same. Everybody agreed that we would fund the positions if we were a success, if this was a resource to the community, if we pulled that off, and it was. And so the police department has funded it for years. We funded our position, Safe Haven theirs, ACO theirs, right, probation theirs. So the, the, the goal wasn't, the goal was to, to create something that was of, of help to other people in the system. But we, have, in this instance, we are funding jobs. But the jobs had to improve the work experience of everybody in those agencies or they wouldn't have continued to fund it, right? It couldn't be just, like, this is the sad thing, Q. You, you're saying they should do it because it supports victims and they deserve that. Sadly, institutions, that isn't their filter. <laughs> it just isn't, right? You're not going to get the police to fund a job because it's better for victims. It's going to have to be better for them too, right? So if, if there was a way to craft the argument to say, if we're doing this, this is saving campus police this much time, right? You got to tie those resource things together so that their lens which is what important to them, that they can see this is a value. We can't lose this. Otherwise, we're going to end up spending twice as much money someplace else because this isn't in place. Does that help a bit? No, that really helps a lot because, I mean, right now, that's what we're trying to do is now that we're running out um, of our three years is create a pitch that that somebody's going to take, you know, that will, that will actually catch, you know, the eye of somebody you know, higher at the institution that will say, yes, we, we want to buy into this. And so I think, sadly, like you said, they're not going to value as much the, the experience of um, the survivors. I, if we tell them, you know, yeah, campus police will be reporting to less calls or things like, I, I like that approach because fortunately that's the approach that I think they'll res maybe respond better to. Thank you. Or, or redesign the approach so that there's a way to track and calculate the savings right, um, with these other agencies to prove that this is a worthwhile endeavor, right? It doesn't become, I mean, it just, it is the deal. It doesn't become about safety. It becomes about time and money, essentially. Um, and then you have to be able to show that it's a value. And so, so that's why when we organize, we're always organizing through that lens. How are we going to prove to the system that this is what it, this should be continued to be funded because it actually saves time and money for their agency, right? Or we're changing the structure of how cases get processed, or we're changing the policy on how cases get approached, which is then just static. It's gonna stay there regardless of whether there's money once we get that work done. So, yeah, good. That's fantastic. Um, thank you for that example, Q, that was really helpful. Thank you. Can I make a suggestion also? Sure. Really. Also depends on if you have any money left on the table, any funding left, so you haven't used it, um, you might be able to ask them for an extension. Do what, I mean, what Scott was telling you, but the expert ask for an extension because there's still funding on the table. If yeah, they, 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 they got one, right? We got two in ours. We're, we're, we're trying for a second. <laughs> Not going to lie. We're, I was just in the process of writing up a second one. <laughs> yep, yep. Yep. Yeah, we, well, we got two, so I think you'll probably get it. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, so that's the grant-driven justice project. And 
cube just so well laid out the struggle um, with that, with when you, when you, I mean, if you'd have had this lens when you wrote the grant, it looked a lot different, right? Um, not because the idea wasn't good, but because you weren't finding a way to link it to what was gonna motivate the system to continue to fund it, right? Um, yeah, um, I get so many calls like the one that Q just gave us and they're two years into a three year, three year grant and they said, hey, you know, how do you get agencies to actually do what they said they were gonna do in the grant? And I said, <laughs> I said, well, what have you tried? Well, we told them you signed off on the grant. You're a co-signer. You're supposed to do what it says. I said, that's not why they do what they do <laughs> because they sign. They didn't know what it meant to sign it. If they knew what it meant to sign it, they might probably wouldn't have signed it. But you, there's a whole, there's like a year's work of setting up a community so that everybody's fully informed about what we're actually trying to accomplish before you even write the grant, right? All the work is before the grant's even written. Once you get everybody to say, yeah, that's a good idea. I think we want to do it. Now we put the, put the idea in place uh, and write it down and see if we can get funded for it. But, um, but when nobody really comprehends what it means to sign that dotted line, and then it comes down to it and says, I got to change my policy. Nah, it ain't going to happen. Sorry. Right. Then you're stuck. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the next is the Duluth model. Um, and this one, uh, as I said, most of what our agenda for change is coming from is from the people we serve. So we will get a problem that comes to us and then we will go to the system and say, when your agency intervenes in the lives of these folks, this is what they're reporting happened. And we'd like to figure out one, why that is. We don't know why. Um, We'd like to figure out what the solution is um, and, and, and create something, either a tool, protocol, change in policy or both um, that directs officers to do something different um, and then follow it up to see if it actually worked, right? So now they're clear on what we're going to try to accomplish and they're actually clear on what the problem that's been articulated is. We may not know why it is, but we know what it is, right? Um, and I'll talk about that distinction as we go. So the Duluth model creates a distinctive form of organized public response to domestic violence. And it's characterized by a clearly identifiable and largely shared assumptions, the thing we did today, and theories about the source of battering and its effective means to deter it, right? This is the problem. We all agree this is the problem. So now we can agree on the effective means to deter it. Empirically tested intervention strategies that build safety and accountability into all elements of case processing, right? You gotta know how the case gets processed before you can build safety into it, before you can build accountability into it. If you map out how cases get processed in your jurisdictions, you will start to see gaps all through, right? And I'm even thinking of Alexandria the, who, who brought up the fact that the population of um, women who experience harm that she works with are not, it's not even an option, right? To know what that is, to know why it's not an option, right? And to see if you can see that reflected in the actual practice of the government when they intervene, right? So is there a gap between um, what the women are experiencing and what the government's reinforcing, right, um, in the lives of those women. And then you have something real to come to. If you just say, you're not an option, and so I'm gonna write you off, right, then that means that, that all the women who are gonna access that system are still gonna end up with the same barriers and, and get taught the same thing that this group of women has already learned. Why continue to, to, to go down that road when um, there could be a way to change practice um, in that system. So they're not reinforcing this notion that the system is of no help, right? Because it can be. All right. Um, and then well-defined methods of interagency cooperation guided by advocacy programs. Um, the reason we have advocacy programs in there is because they're the most closely um, 
uh, positioned to understand the reality of the effects of abuse because it's what they work with every day, right? And so we have a lot of people from the batter's intervention field, I think, in here. We have a lot of people from the advocacy field in here. No two groups in a CCR have a more qualitative intersection with the problem than those two groups, right? Together, you can be a powerful voice within your CCR to help people understand the nature of the problem, the nature of the solutions to those problems, right? But when we get at loggerheads and we don't cooperate, the only folks that benefit are the offenders, right? They just, we just give them a big crack to slip through, right? Same thing with the victims. They're not, they don't benefit by the fact that the advocates can't stand the betters in the friendship program or vice versa. Nobody benefits from this. Um, so um, working together and finding a way to help change the way that folks discuss, talk, think through and solve problems based on what you experience in your programs can be really powerful and effective. Um, so that's why I encourage that, that, again, that partnership specifically um, because of how helpful you can be. Um, all right, next slide, Jeff. So if you think about the Duluth model method of organizing, that, that's that top bar. What it organizes is a coordinated community response, right? And in this case, what you see are governmental and non-governmental agencies that are all coordinated they all have um, policies and uh, practices that are consistent with the same principles, the same shared understanding that everybody adheres to um, in the CCR. That way, when somebody gets processed through that community-based or government system, it is a consistent message that the offender gets and it's a consistent message that the victim gets um, as they intervene in those, in those systems, right? So one of the things that I've learned from women who experience harm is that the lack of predictability in any given system is, 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 a, is a message to say, you don't want my participation, right? So in Duluth, if a woman comes into an advocacy office and says, you know, I got a black eye, I wanna report this, but I don't know what it means to do that. The advocate can say, all right, so here's what's gonna happen if you wanna report that to the police. We're gonna call 911 and they're gonna dispatch a patrol officer to this facility. They're gonna come in and this is, these are the questions they're gonna ask you. Are you comfortable asking them? The answers to your questions will ultimately go to him. He will be able to see them. Are you okay with that, right? She's making an informed decision about her participation because we can say this is what's gonna happen. Now this case, if he gets cited, because this wasn't an immediate arrest, if he gets a citation, he will not be incarcerated because it's after 72 hours. So he will be out and a court date will be set and he will be arraigned, right? You don't have to go to that arraignment, but you can if you want, right? We can lay out that process and she can decide whether she wants to be it. Now, if, 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 the, if the question is, what'll happen if I report this? And the advocate says, it really depends on who comes. I don't know. Well, forget it. Not gonna be part of this. If you can't tell me what's gonna happen, then I don't wanna be part of it, right? Predictability is what a coordinated response can give advocates working with victims, right? and they can make informed decisions about their participation or not in that system, right? Uh, James. Can you go back to slide that you just did? Um, sure. Okay, so when I look at this, <clears throat> and thank you for having it. So I look at that as kind of the foundation to most coordinated community res responses. And then I think in today's age where we have all of this um, justice reform and bail reform, and we see really dangerous people being released with no bond, um, I, I think we have to look at every single person who could possibly touch that file or talk to the offender or the alleged victim, right? So from your 911 operator to the guy who locks me up in jail to pretrial services to the magistrate and try to think how do we get 
because they're all getting training, all getting pushed down, de criminalized, right? Um, bail reform, let people out of jail, no over incarceration, COVID, all of this stuff. And so we see a huge uptake in women being killed throughout the country. So I think as we're looking at this, there's so much training through OVW for probation, for prosecutors, there's training for BIPs like this training here. But those other people that touch the case before we get them, oftentimes are not receiving this type of training and aren't invited to the table. And I know in Washtenaw County, we did a pretty good job. We had great batters intervention, judges, prosecutors, you know, our shelter was really strong. Um, but then we would sometimes invite different community members like the Humane Society or other people who may not want to come every time, but just having them come to us, talk to us about their mission, how their mission can work with us, and then us tell them what we can do for them. And, you know, they weren't going to come every month, but they would come, you know, every once in a while. And that was nice. The other thing I think that I see communities doing now is moving away from just criminal, where they're doing a coordinated community response and looking at faith-based communities, or a lot of people are doing uh, the medical profession. So we're looking at EMTs, you know, e e emergency nurses, all that, and said, how do we get the right test, the right medical um, intervention for the person who was harmed? And then how do we train our police officers to know when to call EMT, right, and all that stuff. So I think we can really bridge off this and, and we might not be able to get the ER nurse and the ER doctor and the same nurse and all them to come to every meeting, but we can kind of take our regular meeting and say, hey, this quarter, we're going to focus on health care, right? Or this quarter, we're going to focus on the faith base and really kind of expand this a little bit. Yeah. And so, so like 911 is an example. We sat down with 911 uh, call takers, dispatchers, and a supervisor and then we also um, added law enforcement because law enforcement is heavily um, reliant on 911 to find out where they're going and who, how much danger there is. Um, and then a prosecutor and then some advocates. And we just sat and listened to 20 random calls uh, around domestic assault just to hear what we hear, right? And what we heard a lot was call takers getting off the call before law enforcement had arrived on scene which was actually against their policy, but it was happening frequently. So we're all sitting in this room, this woman's on the phone and she's saying, I'm locked in my bathroom. You can hear him beating on the outside of the house, trying to get in. And she said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm locked in my bathroom. So tell them that's where I am. Um, tell them the police, that's where I am. And, um, and he's eventually gonna get in because he always does. So you need to hurry. And she said, they'll be there soon. If you have any more problems, give us a call, click. And everybody in the room quit breathing because nobody knew what happened, right? Like that's the moment. It put all those practitioners in the room with her, right? Um, as opposed to just, you know, I've got another call. So what the supervisor did is went back and in their system, they're able to track whether there's another call coming in that they have to take because all of the call takers have been, are, are on, on, on a call. And that wasn't happening, right? So now we discovered a gap, right? Not following policy that actually says, stay on the line until the law enforcement arrived. Because what the law enforcement officer said is, that's not helpful to me. Because if he's broken into that house and he's got a deadly weapon on her, I'm walking in blind. I have no idea where he is. I have no idea what's going on. And now my life is at risk, right? So you got to hear from layers what the problem was. Now, this wasn't a training. This was uh, basically an evaluation of the current state of the response of 911. And from that, we developed a protocol for 911 call takers in partnership with 911 and the Sheriff's Department that directed, this is what you will do when a domestic comes in. This is what law enforcement needs from you. This is what prosecution needs from you. This is what advocates need from you, right? Everybody has a hand in that. Um, and so that took us a while to put all of that together, about a year, right? But now when they call, in fact, I just had about three months ago. Well, at the time, oh, if you'll be able to actually speak with anyone. Oh, sorry, thank you, <laughs> sorry. Um, we, I, I talked to a, a woman who had called 911 on a domestic years ago. And she said she called 911 because she saw a domestic on the street uh, where she was living. 
And she said, I can't believe how different 911 is today than it was when I used to call. Um, they were so helpful. They were, they were concerned about me, not just what was going on. And, um, and if I had had that kind of 911 response when I was having all my problems, I'd have probably called more or more readily, right? That's exactly what we wanna hear. That's why we're doing what we're doing, right? Um, but we would have never in a million years figured out those problems if we wouldn't have sat down and talked to women about what their experience was and then listened to the actual calls. The other thing that women told us in focus groups, and these were women who were living in halfway, Duluth has a lot of group homes. Um, and so we had some women that were in group homes and they said, when we call on a domestic assault because our caregiver in the group home has done has hurt us. What 911 does is calls the group home to ask if it's true. And the person who answers the phone is the person who they're accusing. And so then when the person says, no, no, she's just having a problem, right? Then no law enforcement go. Law enforcement said, that's not 911's job. That's our job. So don't decide for us if we shouldn't go to a scene. Let us know and we will investigate it to see what's going on, right? So again, we would have never known that problem. We'd have never known to train on that problem because we didn't know it existed until we sat down with women and said, what's your experience, right? That's the, that's the power of that process and then bringing that agenda to the floor for change um, with those systems. And, th and then so people say, well, what, how are these agencies open to changing? It isn't because, you know, James is so articulate. It isn't because I'm so articulate. It isn't because David's got all this credibility, right? It's because we can bring the lived experience of this is what happens to people when your agency intervenes, right? That's a lot more motivating than stuff coming from my head, right? Because that, that's not why they get up. They don't get up to do a very hard job to make people's lives harder, right? So that's motivating. That's, and if that doesn't motivate, then I'm not sure what will. But um, done well, and we'll talk more about focus groups tomorrow. Done well, they can be a very motivating um, factor in getting people to shift. Right, okay. Next slide, Jeff. So there's the system, right? Um, if you make me disappear for just a minute there, Jeff. <laughs> there we go. Um, so that woman and her kids is struggling with violence that night. So she called 911 and she enters into all kinds of community-based and government systems. And each one of those systems have their own timeline, right? She has, she did not ask for that, but that's what she got. Right? So if she's going to call into that system again, then that system has to be to some extent a resource to her. But what you hear from so many victims is that that system constantly wants something from me, but they never have anything for what I need. Right? They want me to testify. They want me to give a statement. They want me to show up. They want me to apply for this and apply for that. Right? But what do they have for me? And are we a resource to her? So what we're doing is we're taking all those different agencies and their timelines and finding a way to coordinate them with her in the center rather than the systems in the center, right? And that takes work, years of it, to undo how that's evolved in your communities. But you start somewhere, right? Um, and the women will tell you where to start. They'll tell you where the biggest problems are. And there's your agenda. All right, next slide. So I talked about advocacy agencies tend to be in a Duluth model CCR, those who coordinate the CCR. They're the ones positioned to do it um, in most communities. But then if that's the case, or if it's gonna be the case, then how are you gonna resource that position, right? Is it somebody who's an advocate who on Wednesdays facilitates a meeting? that's not gonna get you very far, right? Um, is there state money that can be allocated so that people can, can have the resources to do the organizing that, that you're asking them to do? 
um, how are you going to fund that, um, that position? Victims and their experience provide the framework for designing and advising the work of the CCR. If interventions need to enhance and be linked to the work of the next agency processing the case, the focus is never on the individual worker, it's on the policies, protocols, and practices that inform the worker's actions. Essentially, it's what I've been saying for most of the day, right? Some version of that. That's what the, 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 the guide is for doing that organizing. Um, next slide, Jeff. Um, each intervention needs to balance prioritizing victim safety with offender accountability and improving the experience of the practitioner. That three-legged stool is so critical. Q just so articulately put it. If this is only benefiting, if I go to the police department, for example, if I go to child protection, for example, and I say to them, I've got this idea that would be really helpful to victims, but it's gonna take your workers an extra hour per case per day to do it. I, I can assure you with every cell in my body that they're gonna say no, they're not gonna do it. But if I can say that if you do this, it's not only gonna make it safer and easier to hold them accountable, but it's gonna be easier for your practitioners. Now you got their ear. Duluth started their CCR in 1980. In 2017, CPS, raised their hand and said, we want to be part of it. Ellen had, had made multiple attempts over the years to get CPS involved, failed. I made attempts, failed, right? And then what happened is everybody, literally our ten, average tenure in CPS was 21 years. That's the average tenure of a worker in CPS. Every one of those people retired to the person. And all of these young folks came in and said, you know what? When it comes to domestic assault cases, we're terrible. We're making it worse for victims. And we hate that. We need help. The supervisors then came to us and said, can we work on something together, right? So this, this, this idea of prioritizing and balancing um, safety, accountability, and worker experience, the first thing I said as an organizer to them right? I got one shot at the apple tree on this one. Otherwise, all the apples are going to be gone and I'm never going to get another one. What is your biggest struggle that your investigators have around domestic assault cases? And they said, number one, hands down, we're always chasing information. We don't get reports. I'm working on a case. I've been on this case for three months or two months. and I find out that two weeks ago, he was arrested for another domestic assault and I never even knew it. Now I got to start everything back over again, right? That is so frustrating to us. The first thing that we did as an agency is went in and took all of what we generate on every case and looped CPS into that information flow. We solved that problem, right? It, again, that took us about a month and a half to reroute and get all the approvals and everything to happen the way it needed to. And who was gonna to go to and how was gonna to get to the work and all of that. But we did it. After we fixed that problem that they had, it fixed the problem that victims had, right? Because what's one of the biggest complaints, if you're a CPS worker and what's typically the, the complaint that you get, I don't know if we have any on our call today, but, um, whether I'm in Australia, Canada, the United States, or England, this is typically what CPS, they always say we don't care about victims, right? Um, that we, that we um, take kids away, that we don't care about victims and, and, and all of that. Part of the reason is because the information they get is all about the victim. So that's where they end up putting all their focus. But when we get them these risk files on the guys with all their past police reports, current past, current past order for protection affidavits, risk information, court information in a packet, now most of the information they had on the case was about him. And what happened? Their focus shifted from her to him. <laughs> so, it improved their ability to hold him accountable because they knew him. 
it improved the safety of victims because they weren't focused on trying to get her to do everything that, to hold him accountable. And it improved the work experience of the practitioner because now they had what they were always chasing, information, current and up to date in, in real time, right? After that, we could basically say what we wanted, right? You are a resource to us, help us continue to figure out this problem. So we have evolved to the point now where we have a domestic violence team of, of social workers who are testing out new materials that we've developed um, for CPS to see if they actually are, have traction with, with frontline workers. And um, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's, it's really exciting. But we couldn't have got to that if we wouldn't have tried to solve their problem first, because that gave them the confidence that this, this agency is a resource to us, not just somebody who's gonna criticize and point fingers, right? Yeah. Any thoughts, questions, comments? All right, you don't have to have any. <laughs> um, I know you probably do, and I know there's a lot of people on the call. Sometimes that, you know, but I encourage you, if you've got a thought, if you've got an idea, throw it out there, because any, you just enrich the conversation when you participate, I'm telling you. Um, at least I think so, because I've listened to myself for long enough. I'd love to listen to somebody else. Um, all right, next slide, Jeff. Okay, so um, here's what I wanna do. I wanna give us 10 minutes, instead of going to the next slide, I wanna give us 10 minutes to go into small group. Given what you've heard so far about the problem and about how we structure CCRs, talk about either whatever has traction, either what are the barriers to trying to do something like what we're talking about, right? Or if that's not a conversation, what kind of model are you using? Where it has it gotten you? And if nothing changes, where is it gonna go, right? It's kind of like, are you doing a grant funded justice model? Are you doing a judicial council? If nothing changes, what's the future look like? And what needs to change so that you, you would be happy to continue to invest your time, your valuable time um, in coordinating responses in your community. So wherever you, barriers or where you're at and where you're going, right? And then we'll come back. So we'll give you 10 minutes um, just sending the invitation, I think. Yeah. No, all right, it's good. <laughs> Jeff never wants to be on camera, but there is a Jeff, I tell you, I've, I'm nothing without Jeff. <laughs> so, all right, um, the invitation's on the way. We'll see you in about 10 minutes. Okay, everybody's coming back. Here you are. All back, great. Okay. Um, what I want you to, well, okay, so to start off, does anybody want to kind of share the nature of their conversation in their small group? Like what were the barriers? What were the, where are you at? Um, where are you going to go? Nothing changes. Anybody have any insight into that they want to share? Uh, Vincent. Um, just kind of a general commentary that at least for uh, my organization in Albuquerque, we tend to uh, be siloed within all the uh, DV organizations where um, uh, where little guidance is, is that are all CCRs localized because uh, even now the city in taking recommendations from a task force that was dedicated to domestic violence is now implementing even their own structures uh, that are actually treating uh, the nonprofits uh, kind of insulary to their planning. So uh, for us, it feels really disparate at this point. And uh, uh, just the, the, the conversations that I was getting a lot of benefit from is the, the structures between uh, MDTs and CCRs and then how to begin to even coordinate that when there seems to be an overarching organization that kind of is pulling everybody else along without necessarily involving them. Yeah, and so, so do you, do, Vincent, do you know 
what they're focusing on trying to change? Like what, what's, do you have any idea what the inside of the plan is? Um, it has so many elements of everything, whether it's, it's victim centered, uh, offender centered, uh, that which is not necessarily domestic violence that requires, uh, sorry, that's domestic violence that doesn't, that doesn't require police presence. Uh -huh. uh, so there's a community safety response portion that comes from the city. So uh, I guess, Scott, I can't answer that really clearly because I don't know what their sweet spot actually is. Uh, so this is why a lot of work is done in, in uh, England and Australia, where governments decide what, what's going to happen, and then they contract it out for people to execute their idea as opposed to going to the people who are on the front line and saying, what do we need to do that would improve it? And then developing a response that <laughs> matches what people on the front line are experiencing, right? Totally different way of organizing. And one that ends up oftentimes creating unintended consequences, right? Because they, they're not in conversation with those they need to be to know what they should be putting into place, right? So I'd call, like David on, I'd call David on that one and get him involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you better call it was it albuquerque yeah yeah albuquerque there's the there's the yeah and just because you want to if, if it, there's an it's really not a coordinated response then there's an initiative to deal with the problem and and who knows what it's going to be but um it's really not a coordinated effort i think you're trying to get to there but uh, for our organization, which of course is a nonprofit, uh, we feel that we are responding the way that we, we really should be into that need. Uh, now it just seems, as I, I, as I mentioned before, I feel like now I'm catching up to what the city is now looking at. And it's yeah. not like we're not involved. It's just that, wait a minute, when did this planning all take place? And uh, all of a sudden, I'm not sure where we fit with the city's plans. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. And if you don't fit with their plans, then who do you serve that doesn't fit with their plans, right? Yeah. Yeah, anyone Scott, else? Scott, I, yeah. I, can, I can sum up um, uh, our parts of our conversation that it's kind of like, um, are there, I, somebody in, in New Mexico, are there Ikeas in New Mexico? Some, are there, is there an Ikea store? So this, I, okay, I, an Ikea store is where you buy this really great furniture, but you have to put it all together. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so many people um, have struggles with that. And so I, I think about the, the coordinated community response, it, both in New Mexico, in Michigan, all the parts of the country that I've seen, they said, we tried that and, we, and it just doesn't work. Um, and it's like I bought a piece of furniture at Ikea and I will never do that again because it just doesn't work. I, I can't do that. And it, it's, there's kind of this, um, I had a bad experience. You know, I had a bad relationship. So I've given up on relationships. I've had a bad CCR. I've given up on CCRs. And one of the things that I've learned from you is you don't have to have the entire band together in order oh. to have a rehearsal. You, you can you can actually start uh, start this process just with you and another organization in town and and to go from there. And I think that is something that's a well kept secret, Scott, that you gotta you gotta let go of. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it, my way of I, instead of using IKEA, I'm gonna say it's not the United Nations. One veto doesn't shut the whole thing down, right? So you don't need un un a unanimous vote to go forward. If, the, if, the, if, if one agency doesn't want to be part of it, then you will, you will improve the way your community responds by organizing those who want to be part of it, right? And eventually your success is going to attract the people who are initially saying, I don't want to be part of it, right? They want to see what happens to somebody else first. Um, cool right? We're going to go forward. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Okay. So take what you learned in these conversations and kind of keep that in your mind as we go forward and more specifically talk about the structure of, of coordinated community responses and make the bridge. Cause I can't make it cause I'm not there. Make the bridge between what we are talking about 
and what the barriers that you discussed are or what the structure that you currently exist in is, right? Um, so that could generate some questions. That's what I'm trying to uh, maybe uh, uh, facilitate here is a way for you to be more uh, interactive with what I'm presenting and say, okay, if this is what they're saying is, a, is, a, is an idea, then where are we now and how would we get there and what would have to happen to do that? Or what would be the barriers for us trying to accomplish that? Because that's really the substance that I want you hopefully to walk away with at the end of the three days is actually a plan going forward to address um, your community's response. Yeah. Um, okay, so in your handouts, there's one piece of homework because there's always homework, right? There's always homework on day one. Um, there is a piece called uh, a focus group excerpt. This is a uh, redacted excerpt from a larger focus group, mostly on probation, um, just because I knew Jim was gonna be here. Uh, so, <laughs> so this one's on uh, mostly, like I said, on probation, although other agencies are gonna come into play. I want you to read that and when you take out a highlighter, take out a pen and start writing down the themes of the things you see women that keep keep coming up for them right now here's the discipline they're going to tell you that this is a problem and this is a problem and this is a problem don't jump to the conclusion that probation isn't doing their job or somebody else isn't doing their job you only know the problem that women experience but you don't know why it exists right so hold off a good organizer won't jump to conclusions. They're gonna say, all right, this is the problem as described by those we serve. Now it's my job to go figure out why it's a problem, right? Don't focus on individuals or even individual agencies, focus on basically what the theme tomorrow, the matrix. <laughs> the matrix that's behind everything that you see. That's what we're gonna try and name tomorrow, okay? All right.